Hi. Okay, so we're going to get started. Does uh, can anybody hear me at all? Yes, me? you're coming through fine. Okay, thank you. It's uh, reassuring that I know that the signal's getting out. Welcome everybody to the hands-on court accounting workshop. We have a lot of material today and. We have been adding to the material over a period of time, trying to make the course better and better, which hopefully that's happening. Uh, we give the class about every two months. Here's a schedule through the Contra Costa County Public Law Library in Martinez. It's a pro bono nonprofit uh, program that we offer through the law librarian, uh, Carrie Rowan. And uh, it's been approved by the judges that allow us to give the class. And it's really designed to help the pro per, the self-represented uh, litigant so that they can uh, fill out their papers and work with the judges and get their paperwork approved. Um, we've been given the class now for probably four or five, maybe even six years, uh, every two months. And uh, we enjoy doing it. We get pro per litigants. We also get uh, paralegals in the class from time to time and uh, attorneys and people working in law offices and everyone's welcome. And, uh, but before we get into the details, I was wondering if I could, um, ask a little bit about what your objectives are so we can kind of model the course around your objectives. Uh, does somebody want to tell me why they're in the class? How about Patricia Berkowitz? Hi, Rex. Hi. Um, <laughs> and everybody else. I'm in the class because um, I'm... Um, a trustee in a, in a trust for a friend, and I'm taking over from another trustee. And I don't know what to do or where I should even start or how to go about doing what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah, um, this class is focused on one aspect of, of a state administration. The trust uh, creators passed away. No, she's still alive. Um, I'm the trustee. I I have a dual role. I'm the trustee on the house. So the house is in trust. And um, I, she also, I also have the power of attorney. So I have a dual role. Okay. Power of attorney for financial management. For financial matters only, yes. Yeah. At some point, you might need to get a conservatorship of the person, but... Yeah. Uh, good. Okay. Now I understand uh, the roles and duties that you have. This is one aspect to be able to report back to the beneficiaries and the principal um, what happened to the finances. And there's a, a lot of other things you might want to do a Google search on the word uh, fiduciary duties because you have to be um, above reproach in dealing with someone else's money and no commingling, personal use, anything, personal benefit. And that would be a good place to start. But um, yeah, the teaching, we do trust in a state administration or, or even if a person's alive or frequently we're doing it post-mortem and probates and trust administration. It's a whole subject onto itself. I could probably talk for three days on it. Um, there are a few things to do. And um, so we're not going to be covering that. You'll need to find another source for trustees duties. So thank okay. you for uh, attending. 
Now, if I could uh, ask someone else why they're attending, perhaps Karen. Karen, me, Karen Davis. Um, yes. I'm an attorney. I'm an attorney, okay. and um, I'm trying to learn as much about probate as I can. And I saw this and just decided to add to my store of knowledge. Okay, welcome. Yeah, this is required for probate. It's required for guardianships and conservatorships. And it's optional for trust. And if the trust instrument requires it, then it's not optional. And if a trustee wants to get their court accounting approved by the court, then it's a required format. But uh, learning more about probate, every um, probate that we do and everybody else does uh, has to have an accounting before you get your final order for distribution. And this course will cover the central part of the accounting function. There's others. And, and we also cover, they call it a report, but it's really a petition. When you get your accounting all done and you want to give it to the judge, of course, you can't just give it to the judge. That would be too simple. Uh, you have to do a petition and we call it a report. And we are going to cover that material in the class on what's needed in the report. So this should be very helpful for you. And in terms of format, we teach the class based on the judicial council forms. And we also give you an overview of an Excel method of doing the same accounting, but we focus on the judicial council forms because they've been proved by the court system. And um, a lot of attorneys and pro per people will use an Excel accounting report and put the government uh, judicial council form 400 sum as the cover sheet, uh, but we'll cover what's required and, and what's not in the class. So how about uh, Paula Warner, if you could unmute and let I us I think know. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? I can. Loud Excellent. and clear. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here because I was recently appointed temporary conservatorship for my mom and her estate. Okay. So temporary conservatorship, good. Mom and estate. So that means that you have a permanent conservatorship case pending. Correct. And it, there's some kind of emergency where you need to step in right away to provide services. And, also correct. Uh-huh. And... Um, Yes, you you are going to need to do court accounting. Uh, it's commonly called fiduciary accounting. And um, let's see, temporary conservatorship. So you're conservator of the um, estate and the person. Yes. Okay, both. Okay. So our side that we're working on today is conservatorship of the estate or um it's all it's almost similar to the durable power of attorney for financial management uh and so it, it covers similar things but you're in the right class and this is something that you're going to need to know and um so i'll hold off on uh finding out introducing anyone else here and uh i'm going to go over the um materials first about what we're going to do but uh i wanted to mention that i'm only half this uh duo team here rex crandell and i forgot to introduce myself sorry i'm a cpa and attorney in walnut creek and my other assistant here is tamara brown she's a paralegal tax preparer wonder woman uh about <laughs> everything else you can think of and she's going to be teaching the class on we have separate subjects so uh, we'll be trading off um, i wanted to cover the materials that we 
hopefully sent out with the sign up. And it's also, we have on the sign up uh, Zoom invitation, we have a link to our Google Drive page where we have all the class materials stored that anyone can get from the Google Drive. So some of the materials that we have here that we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on. Usually I did the materials in the past at the end, but I'm just gonna get them out of the way here um, and then we'll get more into the weeds. This uh, first handout, number three, it says non-follow along handout. So you're not gonna see much of this on the screen, but it will be useful to you. Uh, links for information. I have uh, court accounting information from a court website on uh, overview of the accounting process, how to do the schedules, uh, quite informative. Uh, sample pleading paper, if you don't have it. When we first started giving the, paper, the class, uh, it wasn't as common, but now you can use MS Word and just make pleading paper. It's uh, way ahead of what we're doing at the moment, but this is a wonderful cheat sheet when you're doing accounting and you have a split interest trust where there's one beneficiary for income and one beneficiary for the principal. And how do you divide between principal and income and the probate code sections? So if you get out on that uh, avenue, this will be very helpful for you. Um, this is a sample of summary accounting of uh, an Excel spreadsheet that we make available. It's not the most sophisticated in the world, but it is a spreadsheet for doing court accounting. It's not required. It's not on the government forms. Uh, but if you use a GC 400 sum as the cover sheet, this would be acceptable. We make it available. I think it's 150. No, it's $50. Okay. And then these other forms in this non follow along handout are actual probate examiner checklists. So when you turn in your paper, the Contra Costa County Superior Court uh, probate referees gave this to us for the class. So did you do this? Did you do that? All the different items at one point in time when uh, things may have changed over time, but uh, it might be helpful to kind of double check before you um, actually uh, submit your accounting to the court. So this is the non follow along handout. And then, um, at the end, we have a course evaluation. We'd appreciate you uh, filling out for us and sending it back to the court. The law library gives it to the judges to see how we're doing. And uh, I might come back to this uh, handout. It's uh, number two. It's uh, an Excel accounting. And I think it's a work of art. Um, and it's another way to present the court accounting, you need to add the government form, the GC 400 sum, a, in order to um, have it accepted by the court. But it's it's a, a work of art. And uh, we're not going to go through it and dissect it, but we have all the assets by category. We have all the receipts in chronological order. Then we have all the receipts by category. And then we have um, all the disbursements, chronological. Then we have all the disbursements by category. And um, distributions and then the ending property on hand. But uh, this is a wonderful example if you venture out and, and there are some software packages for court accounting. None of them have really taken over the industry. 
And um, there, it, it, it's kind of a mixed match. Uh, they're not all, uh, what do you call it? Um, there's no industry leader. So there's all different kinds of ways um, to do the court accounting. So I'm going to put this away. And how would you like to start, Tamara? I, I'm just going to dive in and talk quickly because I'm going to work each Okay. Night. So what uh, I'll do is let Tamara start her segment, and then I'll be back, and I'm going to be helping with the forms. Um, just so you know, for some of the background on the participants, we have a uh, successor trustee friend um, and a durable power of attorney for financial. We have a temporary conservatorship uh, representative for mom's um, person in a state. So that helps with the context of what we might want to cover. So, Tamara Brown. Hello, good morning. Sorry I'm late, our freeway shut down and sheesh, it was crazy. Anyway, I'm gonna dig in and get started. Um, I myself question, will cover the- I have a question please before we get started. Okay, go ahead. Um, I was a little confused when Rex was talking because he went very um, quickly through it. When, when we're referencing documents that we've downloaded, it would be helpful to have the page of the document. And then my other question is if there are any questions that we have along the way, do you want us to hold off or interrupt? How do you, how are you planning to take questions? Typically, I will um, stop and ask um, if there are any questions. Um, the thing is, it's a lot of material. Um, it's a short time frame. We will end up going over, and I'll tell you that ahead of time. If you wish to stay, you can. If you don't wish um, or you need to go, you can also leave because we give this class um, about every two months, so you can always join the next one. Um, but there will be times where um, you can stop or I'll break or I'll ask if there's any questions and or um, the hardest part is I will tell you right now and I'm just going to be honest because I'm running this all by myself. It's hard for me to watch to see if there's any like hand raises or any questions and still cover the material. Um, so because of that hard part, it's probably best for everyone that I try and go through as much of the material, and then I break and say, hey, are there any questions? Thank you. Is that good, hon? Yeah. I will definitely reference, um, and again, when I pull up the screen, it's a tiny bit difficult for me to see the page, but I will give you, to, because I'm going to go through it and show so many steps, you'll be able to tell actually what page I'm on, but I'll try and remember to start the page. Thank you very much. Any more questions before I start? Okay. I just have a suggestion quickly yes, yes, that um, that maybe we can just have the material up and then you can just scroll through it as she's talking as well. So then you can note the pages that she's on. That's correct. You will be able to see the pages because it'll show up on my screen. Okay, so I also want to start by saying um, hello to everyone. Um, this is the court accounting class. I will go through the starting of it, which starts at the inventory and appraisal. Sometimes um, I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go through this as if you are a pro per and there is no attorney preparing the documents. Although the the documents that we have as samples are are as if prepared by an attorney. So I'll go through both. 
Um, so it'll start with the inventory and appraisal. That's going to be the first document I will go through. Rex will go through the accounting, and then I'm going to go through the, I will come back and go through the petition part, which is how do you get the accounting approved? So that's exactly how we're going to go through or how this will start and go through. So mine um, is going to start with this form. The bottom of the page is 005. Um, the top of the page to look for is the DE160. That's for the initial stand for decedent's estate or guardianship conservatorship 040. Um, depending upon if you're doing a probate, it will be decedent's estate. If you were doing a guardianship or conservatorship, it's considered the GC. So <clears throat> depending upon um, what your instructions are or what you're doing, sometimes people will refer to the GC 040. Otherwise they'll refer to the DE160. Um, so both forms, I mean, it's for both forms. Okay. When you get your forms, it's going to be absolutely a completely blank form. You will not see any of these instructions. You won't see anything like this. So again, this is just a sample and to give you an idea of what should be there and where, but we're going to go through the entire form start to finish. And I'm going to tell you why and what you would put on this form. Okay, so getting started at the very top, again, my sample shows an attorney, but you are, um, I'm going to do this as if you're pro per. So say, for instance, Jared Roberts is pro per, it would just be his name, Jared Roberts, or your name. You won't put attorney at law. You'll just put your address and that's the mailing address that the court has for you on the conservatorship, on the guardianship or on the probate estate. This is your telephone number. Fax is optional. Nowadays, most people don't use fax, so you would leave it blank if um, you don't have a fax machine and your email address. Sometimes people have asked me, well, what's the importance of the email address? I will tell you that typically the courts, depending on which court you're in, which county you're in, they will send um, tentative rulings um, either a week before, a few days before the actual hearing. And what they're looking for is this email address or trying to find this email address on file. So even though it's optional, I always state it's nice to put it there just in case somebody wanted to contact you based on just looking at this form, they have an email address to contact you. But if you don't wish to put an email address out there, leave it blank. Okay, we're going to get down to attorney four. Now, if you are pro per, and I'm going to complete this as if you are pro per, your name that you put here will also go here with the comma that you are the conservator, you are the guardian, or in probate, um, you could be the um, administrator, and or I always put the comma that you are pro per. So basically it tells the judge, the court and everybody else that you are um, not represented and you're completing this form on your own. Okay, in our sample, you will put the court. Now in my sample, we have Orange County. Um, I primarily do Contra Costa, Alameda. Um, actually, I have several attorneys that are down south. So depending on what court um, you are filing this at or your case is filed at, you will put um, that county and the address of that county or address of the court, sorry, with the city and zip branch. A lot of times you may not know the branch. Um, it, it, it would be safe to say probate because I'll tell you right now that um, cases 
for probate guardianships and minors, which have to do with this form, all end up in the probate department. So if you don't know the branch, really, that means sometimes the courts, like Contra Costa has four different courts. Um, and so they're just trying to figure out what court this is going to be heard in. But if you just put probate because you don't know the branch name, they'll know where to get it to the right department. Okay, coming down, it says estate of, not necessarily going to be the estate, but this is the person that's receiving the care, or in some other cases, this is the person that is the decedent. So you will put the name of the, so again, okay, so you, in this case, this person, if they are the decedent, you would mark this box. If they are the conservatee, you're going to mark this box. If they are a minor or you are the guardian and you're doing a guardianship, they would be the minor. On this side, you will put your case number. And down here in this box, this is a really important box because this says when you're going to start your accounting, this um, has a whole bunch of a variety of reasons that you really get this correct. Okay, it's either the de date of death of the decedent. And why is that important? We will, as we go through, I'll explain a little bit more that the um, probate referee who will value property values it on date of death. They don't value it on the day you turn in the paper to them. So that's why it's important to them. Now, and if you don't have a death and you have a conservatee, it would be the appointment date. Now, that doesn't mean the letters date. That means the date the order was signed and you were um, considered the conservator or the guardian. And why do I say that? A lot of times you have a hearing date. So say my hearing date was yesterday and say the court required a bond. I don't have the bond yet. So yesterday being the 19th, let's say, is the day I got appointed. But the day of my letters might not be for a week because I have to go out and get a bond, turn in the bond, turn in the bond with the order, and then get my letters. So there could be some lag time there. You want to make sure it's the date of appointment that you put as the date you're responsible. Okay, so inventory and appraisal and how do you, um, how, how do you, which one of the boxes do you use when you're filling this out? So you will mark a partial if, for instance, um, I'm, I'm just going to use a conservatorship. Say I have a conservatorship and I'm completing this. Um, your responsibility or your duty as the conservator is to go into the conservatee's house or let's say figure out or find out all of the assets that that conservatee owns, right? And I'm talking all those assets. But say you don't know this conservatee that well. Say it's a neighbor and you just happen to say she has no family. I'm going to go help take care of her. I got a conservatorship. Um, and you don't know a whole bunch about her or him. Um you may mark this partial in the fact that, say, for instance, um, you need to get the inventory and appraisal done because it's due within 90 days of your appointment, although they are they let that time frame go a little bit, but you're supposed to turn in the inventory and appraisal as soon as possible. Say, for instance, you kind of think maybe they have um, proper... Uh, rent vacation property or rental property, but you just don't know and you're not sure, you don't want to mark it final because that says, okay, there's nothing more to come. You typically would mark it as a partial just so you can turn in what you do know and then later come back. I don't like completing partials. I typically like to wait 
till I gather all the data and turn in a final, but some people do partials. Um, a partial would be, uh, okay, let me use this other example. Partial would be, say for instance, you need to sell the conservatives house right away. Well, guess what? You're not going to sell that house until an inventory and appraisal is going to be done and the court sees and knows what's the value of the property before they're going to approve the sale of the property. Because, say, for instance, the probate referee values it at a million dollars. You go and try and sell it for 800000 because we're in a bad market or you just want it quick, you want to get rid of it, or you know somebody who will buy it right now, um, you may want to do a partial just to get the value of the home so you can get the approval of the sale. And then later you'll come back and state the other um, the other assets. Um, I don't recommend that, but I've seen some people do it. Okay, the second one could be a corrected one. So say, for instance, you turned in um, a what you thought was a final, and then all of a sudden you found more assets. Oops, um, you would have to mark this corrected, just showing that you're turning in now a second final. Then we have the final. We have the box that says reappraisal for sale. Okay, so why would I ever use that box? Say, for instance, I turn in my initial inventory and appraisal, and um, a year, uh, eight months goes by, and then I determine I'm going to sell sell the house because this inventory and appraisal was initially done based on the date of conservatorship, um, and the appraisal for sale will be based. On eight months later, you would do the mark this box as the um, probate referee to revalue the property as of today's date um, so that you can sell the property and the judge will approve the sale of the property. We have a supplemental. Um, I don't use this box much. I don't. I I, it's either a corrected or it's going to become a final because the first one I did was a partial, but different people use it for different reasons. Um, so it could be a supplemental. And the last one is the property tax certificate. I do not see these um, that often, but um, say for instance, there was going to be a reassessment of property taxes or something of that nature, um, and you wanted to mark the property tax certificate box. Are there any questions on this front part? Because we're going to get pretty intense going down the rest of the form. See, y'all are quiet now. Okay, no, let's get no questions so far. <laughs> Let's get started. Okay, so the appraisal. In this part of the form, um, you will fill out. Please notice it says the total appraisal by the representative. That would be in a probate case. The guardian would be in a guardianship case. Or the conservator. That would be in a conservatorship um, case. It says you will go to attachment one and you will list, okay, so attachment one specifically only list cash, cash assets. Cash means cash, it means nothing else. Cash can be coins, cash can be cash, cash can be a cashier's check, cash can be an actual check, cash can be just cash. Everything else must be appraised by a probate referee. So we're going to go through the two attachments at the beginning. When you start your form, this is going to be blank. You will see um, when we start doing the attachments where this number comes and how it's going to be comprised. So now I'm going to switch to another form which is going to be the inventory and appraisal attachment one. It's number seven on your form. And this is the GC uh, DE161 or the GC041. Oh, 
Okay, up top, you will put the name of the conservatee or the name that you put on the front of the form. I'm going to switch back to that form real quick to show you. It's going to be the same name as right here. And you're going to put the case number. This inventory and appraisal attachment number will be blank, so you will need to put the one in there. And in this case, it's only going to be one page. So I've indicated that up top. And I'm going to give you examples of cash. Now, again, you may not have all of these examples. You may not have any of these examples. I will tell you there's been times where gone in and there is absolutely no cash, no bank account, no cash, and there's only a hot house. What I would do is I would put item and say zero cash assets and then my amount would be zero here and I'm done with the actual form because there's nothing to report. Um, that only happens occasionally. So um, again, I have a lot of examples here. You will not have all of these examples. You may have other examples. Um, so this is only a guide. Okay, so in this case, or my sample, I'm saying there's cash found at the residence of the conservatee. Typically, let me just say for the older generation or the older people, they have to have cash. It's amazing. I will tell you, I, my dad, who is elderly, 88, and I help take care of him. I can guarantee he has $250 in cash um, in an envelope in the house. I, I know where it is. I know it um, because he likes to use cash. So look for cash. Um, the conservancy, depending upon why they became um, conserved, if they have dementia, they may not remember, but just kind of glance around, kind of look, look, wallet, um, stuff like that. I know sometimes, especially if it was a neighbor, you feel, oh, I don't want to go through their personal stuff. No, you're responsible for their personal stuff now. So, um, you can go through their personal stuff, but in this case, um, cash, I don't, sometimes I'm, I used to be cash found where? At the conservatives residence. I don't know that I'd put the address because then you're given away to the world or anybody else who wants to pull this inventory and appraisal that the conservative people know why people are conserved. Um, so that makes her vulnerable or him and, oh, they have a lot of cash. Let me go just knock on the door and ask for a donation for, I don't know, Girl Scout cookies or something. And I, I, so I don't know that I always do that. Typically, I'll just say cash, um, conservatives, residents. But if you wish to put the address, that's perfectly fine. So over here is the amount of cash that was found or there at the house. So I put $250. Balance in the checking account. A couple of things that's really important. When you put balance in the checking account, um, do not put the whole entire account number. Leave it two, four, or five digits. I myself use four. My example uses five. Um, I will just put the last four digits of the account. It is not important that you put the entire account number. And in fact, you leave... Um, the conservative vulnerable that anybody else can pick up this document and find out where her checking account is, the exact account number, and it just can be ways for fraud to happen. So I do not put, um, and sometimes, or I have seen in other inventory and appraisals that some courts, if you do put the entire account number, you will get a nice little tiny letter from the court saying your responsibility is to protect the privacy of your conservatee and you just violated that. And if you continue to do it, there will be harsher penalties for that. So make sure you do not put the entire account number. 
in this case, this um, for the example, they put the bank name and the address of the bank. I do not usually put the address of the bank. I would typically just say Wells Fargo. Really, it doesn't matter what where the branch is, but in this sample, um, they used the branch location. What's really important with this number right here? A lot of times I have seen, and I will tell you, it's the number one follow-up when I look at accountings. So occasionally, because people know me and know that I do this, I will um, say, for instance, somebody has got their accounting rejected once or twice. They will call me up and say, Tamara, I need your help. I cannot figure out what the court wants. I can't figure out how to get this balanced. I just don't get it. Please look this over. Um, and so I review accountings and attempt to fix them. The very first thing that I will go to when I'm reviewing an accounting, I'm looking at this checking account. I'm looking at the balance you provided. A lot of times what happens is you will look at, um, say for instance, oh, I just got a bank statement and I just used the ending balance. I'm gonna switch screens because I'm gonna talk about something else. So right here, the day of appointments, March 8th, you, got, you received a bank statement um, and it ended March 31st. It started on March 1st. You cannot figure out what the balance was on March 8th. So you just use the number on March 31st and or use the number on March 1st as the beginning balance. Guess what? You're never going to balance your accounting and it will be rejected because the bank is looking. I mean, the court is looking for what was the balance on the day of your appointment. What does that mean? How do I figure out if I only see a bank statement and doesn't tell me a balance on a specific day? What you will then have to do is go to the bank or call the bank, tell them, I doubt calling them will do any good because unless you're already on the account and they know you or something like that, they're not going to give you the information. So it's best you'd probably have to go down to a branch and find out what was the balance on the day of appointment, which is March 8th of that year. Again, if you use a different balance than the balance on that date, you are not gonna get your accounting to balance. It's gonna be wrong. It'll probably be rejected. Conservatorships, let me just say, um, for those specifically, the courts are very strict and they watch your accounting with a fine tooth comb and they're really after protecting the conservatees um, funds. And it's probably one of the most riskiest to the court because I will tell you time and time and time and time again, all the accountings I've seen where quite a few things that were spent of the conservatives' money were questionable um, and um, nine times out of 10, the conservator is charged back for that amount spent and um, it's had to be paid back. So it's important that you have this balance as of the day of appointment. Going down, we have balance in the same savings. I'd say the exact same thing, only list the last four digits of the number and provide the balance as of the day of appointment. Okay, so uh, this is as if I'm walking into the conservatives' home. I um, looked at the mail and I saw they have a certificate of deposit or what is a CD that is considered cash. Um, here's the number or the account where it's in the name of the person and I'm gonna switch back so you can see it. It's in the name of the conservatee and 
her deceased husband, but they were joint tenants. I don't know if I'm going to put all that details or even know all that details, but in this case, it was a sample. And I'm going to put um, the amount of the CD. Okay, coming down, usually you won't see this very often because nowadays pension accounts do direct deposits, but when this um, sample was created, um, pension checks were being mailed to the conservatives or, um, and or the recent deceased person. So if there was an uncashed check, meaning a cash, that, uh, a check that was in the mail that hasn't been deposited yet, um, that is your responsibility to deposit it. But before you do so, you will put on the inventory and appraisal, have an uncashed check from the pension, the date of the check, it's payable to the conservatee, and the amount of that check. So I'm just saying I'm going to be depositing that cash into um, another cash account. Here's another sample of an uncashed check from Social Security. See, in this case, since the date um, of appointment was March 8th, you can tell it, you know, it takes a couple of days for mail to come. So that's why um, these checks were both dated March 1st. So the conservatee hasn't had time to even open her mail because maybe she just gets it. Now, we also have an uncashed dividend check. So on some annuities, um, the dividends are dispersed via a check. And in other cases, dividends are dispersed by being reinvested. In the sample, it shows that the conservatee receives the dividends checked instead of reinvesting it into more funds. Um, and that probably has to do with age or when the account was set up, it may have mandatory distributions or something like that. So in this case, I indicated the amount of the dividend check being $352.70. Then we'll slide down and then you will have the total assets. You will add up all of these columns and you will come up with a total. In our case, it's 57, 59. And I will take that number and I will pl plump it right here to say that's a total of my attachment one. Any questions on attachment one? Awesome. Now let's go to attachment two. Attachment two must be completed by the probate referee. I'm sorry, the values must be completed by the probate referee, but you must complete the details of what goes on attachment two. Attachment two includes all non-cash assets. So um, the a total appraisal by the probate referee is attachment two, and we are going to slide over to attachment two. Ah, let's get to the right attachment. Again, up top, it's going to be the estate of or the conservatee's name or the um, guardian minor's name the case number. This attachment number will be blank. You'll need to enter its attachment to one, page one of one. And I'm going to give you samples of um, some things that you may put on the attachment. In this case, the first one is the real property. Now, I have been asked almost every single time I've given this, how do I even know the legal description, right, of any property? Um, in some case, you may put just the real property in the city of, you know, the city, you would know the county, state of California, 
Um, a lot of times, if I don't know the legal description, I'll put common, just the property is commonly known as, and I don't put in the legal description here. If you have the APN number, you may or may not, um, but you just give as much details as you possibly can. And over here in the value, it will be zero because you are not allowed to appraise that. That's the probate referee's job. Okay, in the second case, we had a vacation home or the conservatee has a vacation home. Same thing, real property, city, county of, state of California. This property is commonly known as, give the address, and if you know it, the APN number. Okay, household furniture and furnishings at the address. So in this case, it was the address of the um, principal place of residence. So um, furniture and fixtures, typically a probate referee will value these at very little. Um, if there is something in the house, like you know there's antique furniture or an um, you know, antique dresser or armoire or cabinets or antique bed set or um it, or very fine art or um you go in and everything is just very expensive you would need to maybe tell the probate referee that somehow some way in this form um and or separate out the antique pieces so household furniture you know typically that's beds and dressers and TVs and um, stuff like that. I think typically I've seen the total value given maybe $500 or $1,000. It's not a whole lot. Um, but if you have like antique dressers or something like that, that you think have a higher value, I would separate them out. So the probate referee gives a different value to just those specific items. Okay, we have that I found there's um, 1,425 shares in Safeguard Investment uh, Mutual Fund. A lot of times what will happen is, again, people ask, how will I possibly know that? You will look through the mail. Typically, you'll find um, a quarterly statement or something. You can look on there, try and figure out how many shares. If you can't figure out um, that question, you may make a call to the mutual company. Again, you're going to have to jump through hoops because they're going to be very careful that they're not giving away information to somebody who isn't authorized to have it um and so but you do need to figure out and state exactly how many shares um of the mutual fund what i also like to do also if i can look at a statement that say a broker has or something like say they have many shares in many different um all state 100 shares in chevron and you know and go through and um state so let's say um i know they have mutual fund at morgan stanley morgan stanley's big it covers a lot of different shares stocks um so i will specifically lay out each one because they will have a different value Okay, in our other case, we I found seven U.S. savings bonds. That's unlikely. I've not seen it ever on any inventory and appraisal, so I don't believe many people have them, but in this case, they do. And lastly, the I say a, a diamond wedding ring to carry. Um, a lot of people ask, why is that important? And then well, I have savings bonds. Oh, do you? Great. <laughs> that's awesome. You better tell somebody you have them because that's hard to find or people aren't going to know that. So if you ever that's get it. conserved, you better somehow tell somebody you have those. Okay. Um, but love it. I love it. Love it. You've been the first one that's ever said that in a class. Um, okay, so down to the diamond wedding ring. Sometimes I laugh when I look at this. I'm not a diamond person. They were just never important to me. 
um, and don't have one. So I always laugh that I go, oh my gosh, if I walked in, I don't know that I'd know a difference between a one carat, a two carat, or even a three, believe it or not. I know the difference between a three and a one because one's bigger, obviously, right? Um, but I, I'm i going to have a hard time with this, I think, if it ever um, happens. But the importance of this, there has been many cases, and let me just tell you, you're going to go, no, really? And yes, really, um, that somebody has turned in, say, for instance, and again, I'm going to use the neighbor. The neighbor becomes the conservator, and they turn in an inventory and appraisal and say, ah, she has a one carat diamond ring. So who gets a copy of this inventory and appraisal? It could be her children that are in other states. It could be uh, her brothers and sisters. Um, they may be in other areas in states. And say, for instance, they know she has a five carat diamond ring. Well, the difference between a five and a one carat, as we all know, is extremely different. Um, <clears throat> and they're going to go, oh no, what happened to, did you just take her five carat ring and replace it with some one carat one because you're going to take it or what's going to happen? Somebody is going to make a comment. Um, and as long as you have put this up front and no one has contested it, say for instance, a year later, two years later, they can't come back and go, oh no, they stole the ring and it's different. No, you had your opportunity to say um, that that wasn't correct and you should have said so then. But to me, I like to say, yeah, that's all I found, whether I take a picture and maybe show as proof if I'm a conservator and the conservatee isn't a family member or something like that, I probably would do that. Um, but it's important that you state everything of value that's non-cash that you find. Now, a lot of people state vehicles. Um, you would want to put the vehicles here. You would list the year, make, model and i always like to provide the mileage because the mileage makes a difference on the value of the vehicle um what are other things say there's a horse an animal you know maybe it's a show horse maybe it's just a riding horse maybe um it's something like that um it could be a boat it could be uh anything that's a non-cash asset it could be a travel trailer home it could you know i could go on and on on the different things um it could be uh gold coins but that would go back to the cash assets um it could just be maybe a collection uh, maybe the person used to make soap, so they have a soap collection and they have all their molds and stuff like that that would have value. Um, and if it's going to be sold later, you would want to put that on here so that it can be. So just give as much as you possibly can to the probate referee so they complete this and give a value. At this point, though, let me just show you're going to complete this and everything's going to state zero here. You will not put a number and you will not total this up because that's their responsibility. So I'm going to go back to the form because you're done. And we're going to fill out the rest of the form. Again, keep in mind those attachments because we will attach them later. But that's why you will see there's only a value with cash assets. The value that the probate referee is going to give is blank. That will be filled in by him or her. And they will total it for you. So what happens? You will send this completed form. It's two pages. Along with attachment one and attachment two to the probate referee. They will fill out and complete this portion, and then they will return it to you. You will then sign, which we'll get into later, down the form, and you will turn this into the court. It is not the probate referee's job, responsibility, or anything else to turn this into the court or file it for you. That's your responsibility. Okay, moving on down the form that you will need to complete before you send it to the probate referee. 
you are going to declare that you have stated all of the assets. I'm not sure what's going on here, but you've stated all of the assets. And you truly and honestly, to the best of your ability, have provided all cash for attachment one. Or, again, if you were completing this as a partial, you would mark the portion box. So you're being honest. I, I don't know if I have everything. But if you marked this as a partial and only a portion and then later find out there are no other assets, you have to go back and either complete or correct it and mark it final. But somehow, some way, you have to turn in an inventory and appraisal that reads it's a final. Otherwise, the court does not know um, what the estate holds. In some cases, the box will be marked that no probate referee is required. The only reason that would be is would be if the conservatee has all cash, um, has no home, has no furniture, has no cars, and only has cash. Or it can be a decedent who has no real property, has no assets um, except for cash. You would mark this box, no probate referee is required. If a probate referee was given to you, you will find that name on the bottom of your order. It's the DE-140 in a probate. In a conservatorship, it's going to be a GC. I'm not even going to guess at that number because I can't remember right now, but it will be your order. It is the court order. It is what you use to get your letters. And I will mark this box and I will put the date. This date will typically be the same as this date. That's a little secret because a lot of people didn't know that. <laughs> and then um, that's how you would mark it. So you were either given a probate, um, I mean, probate referee on an order or you were not given a probate referee. How is that dependent or how does the court know when you filled out, let's say, a probate estate, which is the DE-111, to get a case started, you would have indicated there what assets you believed at that time the um, uh, decedent had. And then based on you will give cash, there are sections where you have to state cash or personal property or real property or things like that. So um, that's how the court knows whether to give you a probate referee or not. Sometimes if you don't really fill it out um, all right, they will ask you during the hearing, do you need a probate referee? If you state no, but later find out you do, you have to go back and ask yeah, typically an ex parte or something of that nature um, for a probate referee to be given to you by the court. Okay, property tax certificate. Um, if you have a real property, you will mark this one that um, you've notified the recorder and the county assessor um, in a decedent's estate that the decedent has passed away for a conservatee um you would not have that because you're going to be keeping the house so um so typically this is only filled out i've seen it nine times out of ten only in a decedent estate coming down there is a date make sure you date this i've seen many that were rejected by the court because people only put type their name and then sign and never put the date you must put a date now again as you will see this form you will not put your name or sign it until it's returned from the probate referee do not sign that this is true and correct to the best of your knowledge under penalty of perjury when you don't even know what the probate referee is going to put here 
that would be a wrong statement um, yeah. and you are held liable. Um, there's no such thing as saying, well, I signed it. Then I gave it to the probate referee. I had no idea what he was going to put there, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, you signed this under penalty of perjury. So don't sign this until you've received it back from the probate referee. Yeah. Statement about the bond. Um, there are only three ways. Um, again, this comes off of the initial filing, whether it's a probate on the DE 111, um, you will state, you will either state you need a bond or the bond is being waived. On a conservatorship, same thing. You will state um, whether a bond is required. Um, I can tell you typically bonds are required if the person being appointed does not live in the state of California, and that is because California courts typically don't have jurisdiction over them, but they really do because the conservatives here, um, but they will um, issue bonds also or request that you obtain a bond. Um, other things would be if there's a lot of cash um the courts want to make sure that cash doesn't disappear because somehow, some way, it's the craziest thing. Cash flies in the air, I swear. Nobody knows where it went, what happened to it, how it's gone, but it does. It disappears all the time. So the court will um, order a bond. So in the case, um, either bond will be waived. A lot of times in a decedent's estate, if all the heirs agree um, to waive bond, um, they will turn in a bond waiver with the court and the court will state, okay, no bond is required. Or if it's a small conservatorship estate where the cash is not really liquid um, or able to move or disappear, um, they won't order it. But I think conservatorships most require a bond. Okay, if you were told you must obtain a bond, you would mark this box and the bond amount. So a lot of times at the beginning, if you don't know your assets, the court, the minimum um, bond will be 20,000. The court will say, I want a $20,000 bond. And I'm gonna ask a question. So somebody be prepared to answer. So in this case, the court has said I needed a $20,000 bond. I filed a $20,000 bond and got my letters. Now, right now, my cash is $57,844.59. If my bond ordered by the court was for $20,000, sorry, $20,000, would I mark this box that my bond is sufficient? Or would I mark this box that my bond is insufficient? It's a question. May I, well, I would say insufficient, but can you ask for the cash to be placed in a blocked account so that you wouldn't then have to increase your bond? You can, but that has to be prior to this, but you are correct, you can get there. But there's a little bit of ugliness with that also. Okay, so would your are you confident in your answer that it's insufficient? No, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, be confident. It's the right answer. So yes, your bond needs to cover every dime of the cash that um, you have access to. That what does that mean and why? That means if this amount was to disappear from the accounts and it just disappears you don't know how you don't know why it just disappears your bond needs to replace that cash that is the whole purpose of a bond what happens is the courts or the somebody would um like a court appointed attorney somebody would go after your bond company and say this amount of cash has disappeared we don't know where it is the conservator doesn't know where it is 
first of all, the conservator will be relieved of their responsibility and no longer be the conservator, but they will go to the bond company and say, we want 57 e 44 59 The bond company will pay it. Um, the conservative will get their cash back and the bond company will come after you um, and get their bond amount back. So in this case, a $20,000 bond would be insufficient. Now, if the court set gave you a $60,000 bond, of course, your cash is only 57. So you would mark that it is sufficient. Now, as it was stated, the other box to mark is there is money in a blocked account. So you can go and put money into a blocked account. And if it's in a blocked account, of course, it can't be touched by you and it has to have court order to spend it. The problem being with that, or the only thing I don't, I really don't like about that, as opposed to just getting the bond, is every time that you ask for funds from a blocked account, one, it's a $60 um, fee to ask for it. Two, it takes a whole lot of time to get the court to get that approved to where you um, want it or need it. Um, and... Those are the two major setbacks of putting money into a, a blocked account. It just cannot be touched by anybody except for via a court order. Um, so if you want it, a lot of times I've seen that maybe a person, a conservator is not bondable for a high dollar amount, then they would request to put maybe half of the cash in a blocked account so that they could, because they only qualify for a smaller bond amount. Um, I have seen that happen. I've seen it where the person is not bondable at all. In that case, the court is going to look at the person and say, really, are you fit to be a conservator if you're not bondable? Likely not, but, you know, maybe there has been instances. Um, but using a blocked account is kind of a tiny bit of a hassle. So the bond is a much better approach or easier, let's say, or faster. Does that help answer your question? Yes, it does. <laughs> but you can, again, you can ask for um, the funds to be in a blocked account. Um, usually with a conservatorship, because their care can sometimes, well, let's say a lot of times, they're only getting a social security and their care, like a case I had um, yesterday I was working on, um, the conservator is asking for house to be sold because she only gets 2200 uh, approximately social security and um, her in-home 24-hour care because of the dementia and because um, she needs feeding and bathing and, you know, all the things that come with that. Her care is like $6,000 a month. And, uh, some people would go, what? 6000 Yes, that's, and that's low. I've seen them as high as 10000 a month. It's crazy wild. Um, but if you're only getting 2200 in Social Security and you have a $6,000 monthly expenses, you're going to start going through your cash pretty quickly um, because you're paying for those expenses. So to have money in a blocked account that you can't touch, you can't get a hold of, you can't do anything with, um, what's going to happen when that conservative runs out of the liquid cash that you do have control of and um, you have to wait to get a court order to get funds released? In that case, you might have to pay for some expenses yourself, ask for reimbursement. It's not easy to get reimbursed um, in that also. It just can be challenging, um, let's just say. But whatever works for you, um, either one of these are acceptable. Okay, you're going to come down. There's another date. 
you will put your name here. They look different because this is an attorney. If an attorney is completing this, they will put their name here. But if you're a pro per, your name will go under both on both lines and you will sign both places. Again, this won't be signed until returned from the probate referee. Okay, moving on to page two. Top, again, name of the person, mark the box, case number. This will be completed by the probate referee. This tells the judge how much they're charging, how much their expenses are. They will declare under penalty of perjury. They will date it. They will put their name. They will sign their name. And they will return the entire document to you to submit to the court. Well, to you first sign and then submit to the court. So again, your package would include page one and two of this DC one, DE one sixty, and um, you will have attachment one attached and attachment two attached. Sometimes, lately, the probate referee is returning the inventory and appraisals with a photo picture of the real property that he um, valued and a um, plot map or um, a map. And so now I'm seeing the probate referees provide a little bit more. So your attachment to could be two, three, four pages, um, just as much as they've returned. So whatever the probate referee has returned to you, you need to turn in with this um with the inventory and appraisal. Now, why is this inventory and appraisal and why am I we talking so much about it when we're talking about accounting? You will see that when you start your accounting, how do you get your numbers? You're getting your numbers from here. And if your number here does not match your accounting summary page, which is the next part of the class, you are not getting this accounting approved your accounting will go right out the door and they will say it doesn't match or they were just reject it without even telling you why. Again, the number one correction that I have that I see time and time and time again um, is the beginning balances on the accounting are not what came off the inventory and appraisal or the inventory and appraisal was wrong. And therefore I'll tell the person they need to go back, correct the inventory and appraisal, and then resubmit the accounting and it will go through. Um, so if that's your case and you get it rejected or something, look at those places. But if you know this ahead of time and you, you have this done and it's proper, then doing your accounting will flow right through. So are there any questions before I turn over to Rex? Because it's his turn to talk now. I will be coming back after he completes or goes through the accounting with you. And I will um, show you how you, to do the petition to get the accounting approved. That's the last part of it. Um, so I will be back as soon as he's done. Again, any questions? No questions. Great. Okay, let me go get Rex. Hello, I'm back. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm trying to let me get the screen set up here if I can. Uh, okay. It's difficult. Okay, so Tamara was covering her specific areas, and I don't want to mess up her papers. And I will tell you where I'm at, but let me do some overview. And uh, what I wanted to say is, um, if you want to provide court accounting, fiduciary accounting as a service to others for a fee, there's no license that you need. It's not required that you have, uh, you know, any kind of uh, CPA, CTEC, LDA, anything like that. You can just offer that service 
you're not providing legal advice. You're just doing bookkeeping and there's no bookkeeping license. The um, petition that we're talking about, we will talk about, is a little bit more on the legalese side. And if you're working with somebody who's self-represented, they should be you know, doing the work or you could help them as uh, on the sideline, but you really can't hold yourself out that you're doing court petitions. And another background factor for guardianships, conservatorships, and probates, this next comment's irrelevant because you have to turn in your accounting to the court for approval. And once your accounting's been approved, then you as a fiduciary are relieved of liability for all the information disclosed. Now, for trusts, if you're administering a trust, unless the document specifies that you have to get your accounting approved, it's not required. And so what happens oftentimes, say we, we're administering a trust and there's threatened litigation or other possibilities of disturbance, and uh, we will bring the accounting to the court so that the court can approve it and thereby cutting off litigation for all the documents. So keep that in mind as a trustee, you're not required for court supervision, but it can be very useful. Um, in terms of getting forms, these judicial counsel forms, I just give you an FYI, the Riverside Superior Court has a group of forms for court accounting that are fillable and they're all in sequence. So they just slide down the screen. You can download them all at once instead of like on the court website, judicial counsel, you download one form, one form, one form, one form. So uh, the Riverside Superior Court has some good information. They also have a conservatorship class that's required uh, both conservatorship of the person, which is an hour long, and a conservatorship of the estate, which is a half hour long video, uh, and also a conservatorship notebook that may be helpful. Okay. So let me get my papers organized here. A sample report. What my section, I start out with the numeric parts, and we start out with a form GC 400, which is the pivotal uh, form for the entire accounting process. Let me, uh, but I want to make another comment. I'm trying to put all these connections together for you to make your activities easier and more productive. Um, I doubt Tamara brought this up, but this book, Conservator Handbook for Conservators, it was written in 2016. Our Judge Sugiyama was part on the committee on this to develop it. It is still the court-recognized educational book and required reading for conservators. And it's available from the Judicial Council website. It's about how many pages? I'd say between 80 and 130 pages long. And it tells you everything you need to know about conservatorships and guardians. And a lot of it applies to probate and to trusts. And it answers a lot of questions. And our class material that I'm going to be covering today um, originated in the conservatorship handbook. So I pointed out as a reference material and uh, another reference material I want to alert you to is if you have a problem on valuing an asset, you know, we'll have a probate referee, which I'm sure Tamara talked about, but Online, there's a 
probate referee slash appraiser handbook that the Association of Probate Referees has published. And if you have questions about the details surrounding a particular type of asset, you can look in the probate referee's handbook and get the information that the probate referee would use as background information. So uh, another resource for you. Uh, in the lower left, you can hardly see it. It says uh, on this page, five zeros and one. So the lower left are the page numbers. Somebody asked earlier about page numbers. With uh, Bates numbering, that's the way we have to number them. So when I'm referring to a page number, that's what I mean. It's in the lower left with all those zeros. And now I'm going to move to another form. It's page number 21. If you've got a full PDF, it might be around page 23. But um, what we're going to talk about now is the centerpiece of court accounting. This is the GC 400 sum. GC for guardianship and conservatorships. And sum is the abbreviation for summary. This particular form is paramount in all court accounting. This particular form, no matter what else you do, this form should be on the top of your court accounting because it's required. Oftentimes people will use Excel and put the Excel sheet on top, okay, but it doesn't meet the uh, court requirements and, and you have to have this, even if you have the Excel with the same details on it. I'm going to go into some of the composition of the form before we get into the numbers. You see the form is designed as conservatorship, guardianship, fine. Whether it's a conservatee or a minor, okay, for guardianship. Now, if you're doing an accounting for a probate, just put in here a state of. If you're doing a trust, like GN Lowry Trust, list that here. That not that because there's no box doesn't mean you don't have to use it. And at the other end of the form, the lower left, I wanted to point out um, that <laughs> this form is adopted for mandatory use. Yes, so you've got to use it. And it is for probate, guardianships, and conservatorships. And it's also used for trust and durable power of attorneys. Another feature of these government forms, judicial counsel is what they call them, judicial counsel forms. Um, the California Supreme Court is up here and right below the California Supreme Court is the judicial counsel. They're like the board of directors for the Supreme Court. And below that is the administrative offices of the court. So they're the ones approving these forms for the court. And in the lower right, if you have a question, you're going through, now what, what am I supposed to put here? I, I just don't get it. Uh, if the form doesn't uh, illuminate it for you, in the lower right, you'll see code sections. And you can go to the code section and see what the code says about the form that you're working on. And then there's, that's under the probate code, just a search on Google. And then sometimes you get a reference, this is California rules of court. So it's a reference material. I call it a breadcrumb trail. And uh, Tamara says that it's worthless and nobody needs it, but sometimes it's worth it. And reading the, probate code. Um, I can attest I can attest to that, Rex, that sometimes I use it when I don't know where to turn. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and <laughs> great. Well, thank you for that comment. Um, and uh, one thing I, I, we do a lot of tax and accounting and administrative and law stuff. Um, the probate code is way more readable than the internal revenue code. That thing is a monster. 
it's like section, reference, cross, letter, D, uh, all over the place. But the probate code, I encourage you to look at it. It's not as intimidating as somebody might first think, just because it's a statute. So I'm glad that someone read it and found it was readable. <laughs> Um, okay, so you got the case number. I'm going to go through the components of the GC400 sum cap sheet. Think of it as a wheel and their spokes. And the GC400 is right in the middle of that wheel. For everything else that spins off from it, all the schedules, they all come back. All roads lead to Rome. All schedules lead to the GC400 sum. Okay, so... We're doing this example, first accounting, date of opening of account. It's your date of appointment, not your date of letters. It may be a few days different. And the closing is 364 days after that point. And Tamara may have mentioned you have your inventory and appraisal due nine, after 90 days from your appointment. And then after a year, you have your first annual accounting or this sheet. And that's on year one. And then every alternate year thereafter, you have another accounting report due with two years of data. So as a guardian conservator, hopefully the probate's not open that long, but you have accounting due on the end of year one three, end of year five, and end of year seven. So you just keep on marking which one uh, report you're doing. For trusts, uh, they don't have that kind of schedule. Now, starting out, this form is divided basically in two halves, charges and credits. I went to accounting school and these words are foreign. They're not given people in accounting school. They don't really make sense because the law defined them themselves. You would think it charges you're going to owe something and credits you're getting something back. That isn't the way it works at all. For the charges, that means responsibility. In other words, you're charged with the responsibility of this money from someone else, like you're holding money for a third party, like a bank holds money for you, and you are responsible for it. So it's charge of responsibility. And the word credits means you're relieved of liability. You're credited from another way to say liability um, and it's frequently used is called burden. So you're burdened with one point three million of dollars of someone else's money. And by gosh, you're responsible for it. And the judge is going to make sure it's used properly. And then you get a credit from that burden or lighten your load by what you disperse it for that's appropriate and beneficial to the ward. Ward is the same as conservity or guardian and conservity or or, <laughs> or the guardian. Um, so credits relieve your liability or responsibility. And then we get to the end of the form. What are your assets at the end? And these have to balance what you had originally plus what came in, what went out and what do you have at the end? And these two numbers, the 1.4 million, 1.4 million, must match or you are not done. The court will, that's the first thing they look at. And if it's off a penny, they'll kick it back to you. I wish they would do like IRS. IRS says, don't give us pennies, round to the nearest dollar. We don't care about pennies. And realistically, pennies don't mean anything anymore. But the court's a little retentive and won't let the pennies go. So you're stuck with them. So as we walk through this GC 400 sum, you're going to have dreams about this form of GC 400 sum. Geez, okay. Um, but it is pretty important in this context. 
these two numbers here, beginning assets on hand at the beginning of the account, we have cash assets and we have non-cash. And what Tamara just went over with you in great detail was how do you get those numbers? As she mentioned, the cash is just from your beginning inventory cash and the non-cash was made available with the assistance of the probate referee so that you know the value at the date of your appointment, what the market value of all the assets were. And uh, another comment for trust and estate administration, a trust, if like say someone dies and you need to get value of real property, the probate referee can and will appraise that for you. And it's important to get a stepped up tax basis when someone dies. So most people don't realize that the court referee can also value assets for income tax purposes that you get a stepped up basis at date of death. We sell it the next day. There's no gain or loss, even though the person may have bought the house for 50,000 and they sold it for 2 million because of this stepped up basis. So just another use for the probate referee. And, and let me give you another comment about how to study this material. I realize it's pretty thick. I realize we're going through it pretty fast. It's also available to you on our YouTube channel, California uh, Estate Planning California, Rex Crandell. And one way that you could study it is go back and watch the video. We have several of them on our channel. Another way that I've been studying new material lately that I find is kind of fun is I'll go into a video, record the audio on my phone, and then I'm going to play it back with my Bluetooth and uh, earbuds, and I crank up the speed. So if I want to go through an hour-long uh, training, I can crank it up to double speed, and I can listen to that twice in an hour. And so that's a, another way. And my hands are free doing something else like driving or working in the yard. So I point that out because I am aware that this is going to be a lot of material to someone who's never heard of it before. So those ideas might help you in that digesting of information process. Now, on the income side charges we have various lines and each of these lines are like links like a website link to schedules that we're going to talk about and if you end up you may not have any additional property received so you don't have a schedule number fine and disbursements we have schedule numbers also when you use these other unmarked schedules for some reason they didn't give them any descriptor i would suggest that you call them schedule one schedule two schedule three not the alpha letter a b c d because that was what i thought when i started using them and the problem with that is you say okay the next one schedule e is an echo no it isn't because there's an e down here so to simplify that just use numbers to add additional schedule references. And you might have you know, 10 pages of Schedule A, as you'll see. We'll go through it in detail. So we have static information at the beginning of account. This is what, so that's just a point in time. Now we have all the income, and that is over a period of time, beginning to ending. Then we have a total. And then now we're going to look at disbursements over a period of time from beginning to end of account. And then before you close out, you have one time, again, the end of the account period, the value of all assets. Now, it sounds like what I'm saying is you're going to have to be doing appraisals all the time. So you know the values of things. 
No, you don't. What happens in court accounting, this word here, carry value. And if you liken it to that burden that I was talking about, you had all this weight on your back. You're carrying the burden of all this stuff. And carry value is the value that you had when you did your inventory and appraisal and you had the probate referee value all the non-cash. So in that inventory and appraisal, Tamara pointed out that you should probably have a, an asset number for all the cash accounts and an asset number or letter for all the non-cash. And during the entire accounting, even if it's 10, 15 years, don't change those asset numbers, what you originally had them showing as, because the court examiners trace that year after year to see that things match. And so if you sold one of the assets, you sold asset number four and four disappeared, don't renumber your assets. Just skip number four in your list of assets, tough luck. It's not all sequential, doesn't matter. It's just a way to keep the court examiners from reducing the number of questions that you might have. Another comment about doing accounting, when someone does an accounting, there's, and first time, they always have some trepidation about, is this okay? Is this what you're talking about? Does it look like it's all right? Okay. I have gotten approval from our probate examiners in the probate department in Contra Costa Superior Court and other courts will do it also, is you go in during office hours and you ask the probate examiners if your accounting is in the proper format. They're not going to give you legal advice. They're not going to solve legal problems for you. But if you present your accounting, you can get an opinion that say, you know, this kind of looks like it's the right format. And they'll tell you right off, they're not approving it. It's not official. Okay, fine. You just want some informal feedback. So you might do that. It's available. Or you might, you know, want to have some hire somebody to look at it first. It, it, when you turn in accounting, don't worry. If the court doesn't like it, you will hear about it. No problem. They're not bashful. And sometimes they'll kick it right back to you. Um, another thing that you need to be aware of when you're turning in your accounting is a thing called examiner notes or it's called tentative ruling. And so the probate examiners, very trained individuals evaluating probate legal filings, go through all your legal filings and through that checklist that I referred to briefly in the beginning. And they come up with a list of things that they think are defective, missing, changes needed. And all the probate courts in California try to make that information available to you two weeks before your court hearing. So just keep in the back of your mind, two weeks before your hearing, start going to the court website, look for what they call examiner notes or tentative rulings for your judge that you're gonna have and bring up your case and read the laundry list of things that the probate examiners have said that you need to comply with. And you want to do that as soon as it's available. You fix the forms. Okay, you left off a form XYZ. Okay, get the form, fill it out, give it back to them before the hearing. Otherwise, what will happen is that when the hearing takes place, the judge is just going to tell you, hey, you need a form XYZ get out of here. We'll give you a hearing in another three months. So you want to try to avoid that for efficiency purposes and um, resolve all the examiner notes before you're here. Okay. Back on the details of the GC400 sum, 
Uh, I'm going to get into the sub details. Oh, another point when you're doing the GC 400 sum, instead of leaving lines blank, put a zero. If you don't have it, put a zero. That That's an affirmative statement, not saying, oh, I forgot to include that, or I'm not sure, or I didn't do it. So you put a zero and it's clear, you're meaning there is none. Okay, so we'll move on from page 21 to cash on hands on page 22, uh, 21 alpha, okay. Um, cash on hand at the beginning of the account period. Okay, well, this sounds familiar, oh gee. It sounds just like our beginning inventory and appraisal. It is. You can just bring it forward from your the inventory and appraisal that you filed seven months earlier and list the assets, cash assets that you listed then. And then the non-cash assets from your inventory and appraisal. And it'll match and the same asset numbers on your inventory and appraisal you only have this column which is carry value and that is as of your date of appointment not letters of appointment and or in a probate or trust you might have carry value as the date of death and that never changes carry value now in your first accounting, they want to know the estimated market value. Well, hell, I got a probate referee that told me what it was worth. What are you asking now for? Okay, your first accounting, you leave that blank. You, it's the same. On your second accounting, at the end of the second year, let's say, or third year, just go on Zillow and just estimate what the value is. It's no harm, no foul. You say the, the, the five carat diamond ring was worth 5,000. Now it's worth seven. You know, it doesn't matter. You just put the market value to the best of your ability. And it's helpful if you're managing a large portfolio of stock to help um, support the fact that you're managing the assets conservatively okay on the uh pages you'll see how many pages of how many pages ph of one of seven two of seven so just keep that clear so that when you change four numbers the court is alerted that you've gone on to something else um and as I mentioned, the asterisk means you don't have to do an appraised value on your first account, which will be at the end of your first year. Okay, now this form is optional, but I like it. It's a summary of the schedules that are going to follow. So interest in dividends, let's say you might have five pages of dividends and there's no cumulative total on those pages. So I like to do a cumulative total on this uh, GC 400 AC. And I'm on page 22 right now. So just list all of the, the seven pages of dividends and let's say all the 12 months of social security payments. And then you run a total of all your assets on Schedule A, which happens to be the income items, and then the disbursements, the same thing, all of these lines will be linked to multiple pages. And Schedule C, the disbursements for your outflow. So I find it helpful. It says, don't file it with the accounting, but I've never heard of anybody getting shot by the court for doing it. Um, it's option. Okay, so now we're going to look at receipts and disbursements on the Judicial Council forms. Rule number one, list every transaction. 
if you've got a statement from Safeguard Investment for dividends and you've got a three month statement and it says $1,100 for all of them, don't put that $1,100 in. You have to list every transaction on the dividend schedule from the um, broker. And same with bank accounts. Every transaction from every bank account. Um, another thing I wanted to point out in case it impacts anybody, when you have a conservatorship and it's a husband and wife, they have a long-term marriage, all their assets are community property. I have seen cases where the papers are filed so the surviving spouse, not surviving spouse, let's say the, the other spouse is incapacitated like Alzheimer's or something. And the court wants an accounting from the other half of the community property asset person. Well, it's not required. And I have seen cases where people have dutifully been doing accounting they did not have to do. So the example is husband and wife own everything community property. Husband or wife gets incapacitated. Let's say husband. And then the wife has absolute control to manage the community property without a court accounting, not even required at all. And so if that's the case, uh, you can look at probate code section 351, 354, and 5. And you should not have to be doing um, and submitting an accounting. Okay, receipts of interest. Okay. List each interest from the, the bank statements. Or in California, savings alone, whatever it is, item by item. And here we go with the page numbers A form, page two of six. All right. Pensions, list each of them. There again, you'll probably pick them off the bank statements. Receipts, rent, uh, rental income. We have, in this example, Newport Beach rental. So you list all the rental income item by item. So it's different than a tax return where we have, example, would be a Schedule E as an echo. We show the income at the top and then the expenses by category below. Court won't accept it. List each item of income, and when we get there, at least you'll list every item of expense. It's kind of tedious at times. Um, this says rental income. I would separate, if you have two or three rentals, put all of one rental in one group, and then the next rental in another group, and the third rental in a different group. This applies to passive rental income. It does not apply to a business. So if you have a business, which you might not think of as a business, but let's say you have an Airbnb business or a bed and breakfast, some other thing where you're re-renting a lot of uh, property to short-term rentals. Those do not apply here. They go on the business schedule. And right now we're on <laughs> page 26. I'm going to bounce back to page 21 because you should tab these this page 21 with a yellow sticky or something because we're going to be going back and forth to this form all day. So I was saying for the rentals, you don't, for a business, you don't put them under just a passive rental. So this is net income from a trade or business during the account period. This is wonderful if the person has an ongoing trade or business that you don't have to do all the business bookkeeping. You can get 
an income statement, profit and loss from the company's accountant, and the net income you just put down as received, and you don't get into all the detail on this line six. And the same thing on line 12, if the profit and loss statement shows that it was a loss for that same accounting period that you're reporting on. Okay. So let's see where we are. Where did we leave off? Okay, so we have a bank account. Okay, investment dividends. We have transactions from loan, page 24. Pension, each pension payment comes in and is listed separately. You'll get used to all the detail on this after doing it a bit. Uh, rents, that's where we left off for the business. Now, Social Security. Um, a while back, we had a probate examiner take our course. Each one of the probate examiners in our court have to take our class. And the probate examiner pointed this out immediately as an error. You'll see here on date of receipt. Remember I said that you have to list every transaction. You cannot group transactions. And the examiner said, there's three months there. You can't do that, which is true. You cannot group them by multiple months. So it has to be showing every transaction for 757. Now, there's a concept I want to explain to you called netting, N-E-T-T-I-N-G. I'm going to explain what the definition is to avoid and then how this example is similar, but not really netting. Okay, so netting would be you have a rental property and you have the tenant, let's say, is going to repair the porch for $200. And so the tenant does that, and let's say the rent was $2,000, and then you only collect $1,800 because of their efforts. Well, if you report $1,800 as the income, you just netted the transaction and that you cannot do in that hypothetical you would show the 2000 of rental income and then you would show the $200 of barter repair as an expense so the reason why you cannot net transactions is that uh, a lot of frauds have taken place because someone in their books will net pluses and minuses, so it always comes out at zero at the end of the accounting period, and there's all this fraud going on in between. So netting is never allowed in court accounting or in business accounting. Now I'm going to explain a different concept that is not netting, but looks like it at first. Okay, Social Security, as you know, First of all, it has to go directly into your bank account. Secondarily, they take out the Medicare before you get the money. Now, what should you report on your fiduciary accounting? Should you report the gross of the Social Security and then the Medicare separate or what, you know, subtract one from the other? And this item is not netting. What this item is, when you get the Social Security, let's use our 2000 example and 300 for Medicare, you only put on the books what you received in cash that went into the bank. The fact that the Social Security is going to say at the end of the year on the IRS form SSA uh, 1099 is going to be higher, it doesn't matter. That's accountants, tax accountants problem. You're only responsible for the cash that actually comes in, which in this uh, factual situation is netted after Medicare. Don't worry about it. Just account for what you actually received.
receipts, other receipts, miscellaneous. So everything else that you haven't uh, found a category for, go ahead and, and put them on the miscellaneous schedule. Um, and it doesn't really matter what it is. On guardianships, conservatorships, and probates, you cannot pay the executor, administrator, conservator until the court approves and, and attorney's fees representing that individual until the judge approves the payment. So you won't be paying interimly a trustee fee or a guardian fee or an attorney fee representing the uh, guardianship, for example. Um, you have to accumulate that and pay that when the judge approves it. So miscellaneous expenses, it didn't fit anywhere else. And there's always a question about, let's say somebody's real sharp on income tax. Well, they get might get hung up on the fact that is it taxable or not? Is it income or not? No. Income tax is completely different than fiduciary accounting under completely different assumptions. And the fact when you think of a state tax refund, is it taxable or not? That's not the question at all. What we have here is money came into the conservatorship. It's income. I don't care if it's taxable or not. Doesn't matter. It's more money that you have to account for. Okay, so gains and losses on property. So we sold the conservatives' residence. They're in a nursing care home, and they're never going to go back to the residence, and the judge approved the house sale. And we sold it for 250000 gross sales price. You know, we sold the house for a client yesterday. Um, it, the market's really not so good at the moment. And and so sale price 250, care value is 230. That was the appraisal value when you were appointed. Sale price is now, and it shows a gain of 19,100. Find, that's a gain for fiduciary accounting. To me, that's not a gain at all. The gross sales price is not what you netted. You have broker commissions, escrow fees, transfer tax, all kinds of things coming out in the escrow. And they're telling me the income is 19,000. I know that's wrong. Tough luck. That's the number you have to use. We'll get to the expenses in the escrow at a later schedule. And when you're doing an escrow, always make sure you get the final closing statement because people will come in our office, we're doing tax prep, and they'll give us an estimated closing statement. I can't use it. I don't know if they changed it. Is it final? Is it, you know, make sure you get the final closing statement. Okay, residential care long-term care facilities. Normally what we put in here is the normal monthly cost at the care facility or convalescent hospital. And other items like uh, travel or special items that they buy will show as a separate um, expense. And it's not required, but that's just the way we do them. It might be hairstyling or, or extra items, toiletries. It's quite simple. We have clients, 6000 a month for convalescent care. It's not unusual now. We had one client that was $150 a year for housing and medical. General administrative expenses, here again, under disbursements, we're in the outflow. We're showing all these miscellaneous items that did not get picked up in other categories. Some people will ask, 
how many schedules are there possible? And the answer is 38. You're never going to have 38 different types of schedules. What you do is you look at the transactions you have, and then you only get the schedules you need. And don't worry about, don't include blank schedules to make the ABCs match chronologically. Uh, Cordo doesn't want that. Um, disbursements for living expense. There again, doesn't matter if it's deductible or not. Internet, television, whatever it is. Personal items, list them on the living expense standard account. Disbursements for medical. List those, including the co-pays. And property sales expenses. Now we go back to the house sale. Now the disbursements that came on the final closing statement are shown item by item. We have escrow fee, termite, um, broker commission. And you'll notice that there's no net. So in an escrow statement on a house sale, there's one number you never use. And that's the net cash that came out of the escrow sale. Doesn't matter because you have reported all the income, reported all the distributions, the net cash that came back to the conservatee is irrelevant in terms of reporting here. Um, and here we got a, a loan payoff. This item is a miscellaneous disbursement property sale. Uh, there were some furniture and different things for the conservatee that were sold and the assignment company or the estate sale company charged 20% of the sales price as their commission. We write that off. Um, disbursements rental expense. You recall that I said keep each rental separate, which is true. And the same thing on the disbursements, you would want to show rental Newport Beach and then all the rental expenses. Um, rental in Santa Monica and all the rental expenses. Um, what was done one time, we saw it, we thought it was a very good idea. There were a bunch of rentals and the person doing the court accounting showed the income expenses by categories in all of these columns on a landscape page uh, Excel spreadsheet. And the court kicked it out immediately. You cannot turn in any court accounting on landscape format. They will not accept it. They won't accept a spreadsheet, even though it makes tons of logical sense. Can't do it. It must be in portrait mode. And in terms of if you're doing Excel, it must be at least 12 point type. Uh, there's only a few fonts. Uh, they'll accept one of them is Arial, and um, there are, are some other fonts that they'll accept, but always make sure they're 12 point. Another form that is frequently left out is a form called change in form of assets. Now, the change in form of assets is a form GC400F, as in Foxtrot. And the reason why this form, <laughs> I know you can't read it, um, is important is something happened to the assets that it's no longer what it was at the beginning accounting period. And an example of that would be, let's say you had a brokerage account at Merrill Lynch and you had a $3 million portfolio and you transferred that portfolio to Charles Schwab. 
no sales, nothing, just transfer the shares over. That's a change in form of assets that you must disclose on this GC400 some uh, or GC400 F is in Foxtrot. Anytime you just transfer money back and forth from one bank to a different bank. So keep that in mind. It's it's part of your uh, reporting requirement. Um, I wanted to make another comment about dividends. You get a big brokerage account and it's pumping out dividends from all these different stocks. Okay, fine. And as those dividends are coming out, they're being reinvested in more of the same kind of stock. It's called a dividend reinvestment program. And we abbreviate that DRIP. Dividend reinvestment program. So the problem with having that is every time there's a dividend, you must account for it. Every time there is a reinvestment in stock, you have to show it as you bought more stock. So you're going around and around all the time, every month because of this dividend reinvestment program. Cancel it. Tell the broker, every time there's a dividend, don't buy anything. Put the money in cash. And maybe once a year, I will take that cash and buy additional securities. So if you have a large portfolio, that could save umpteen hours in terms of detail that you have to be responsible for. Disbursement other expenses. This again, we're in miscellaneous, everything that didn't fit in other types of expense areas. Losses on sales. We're still in the disbursement section. Now, you had we had this old clunker car, Oldsmobile Classic, and we had a carry value of 3125 We sold it for only 3000 fine. So we're showing a loss of 125000 That's proper. Now, what I'll remind you of is this Oldsmobile had a value that was on the um, inventory and appraisal. Now the car is gone. So that asset number in the future is going to be blank. So just leave it blank, but keep that asset number uh, empty. Don't, don't change and resort all your asset numbers. Okay. So we're at the end of the disbursements now what do we do we've already had a year go by okay we got to get ready to turn this accounting into the court um we're going to have to look at the assets at the um end of the accounting period there are many common problems that people run across in doing court accounting and i'll point out several to help you so perhaps you don't run into them uh, one of which is the GC 400 sum summary doesn't balance. Another thing that the court examiner will look at reviewing your accounting is, have you described how the expense benefits the ward? Ward meaning the conservatee. So let's say you put a hot tub in their house. Well, fine. Does that benefit the conservator? Why does it benefit the conservative? So if you did that, you would want to say that, you know, Dr. Smith said that we were supposed to have a, a jacuzzi or spa because of a medical condition of the ward. So that's all the detail uh, that you want to show and explain everything in the context of the ward. Uh, another accounting problem is having expenses that the conservator, the fiduciary is not responsible for. 
conserving uh, another problem, confusing responsibility with value. We're not looking at value that much. Conser uh, confusing fiduciary accounting with other kinds of accounting. Let me point out something. As a fiduciary, if you hire an accounting service that does not know how to do accounting, court accounting, and they do it wrong and you pay them, guess what? You're going to have your accounting rejected. You're going to have to do it over and pay again. The judge is going to make you pay for that error or service out of your own pocket. You want to avoid that. Uh, if there are assets out of state, it's not part of your accounting. If you're writing checks to yourself as the conservator, that's a problem. And if fiduciaries paying themselves before the beneficiaries, that's another problem. Um, I wanted to point out, so you're getting into this accounting and you say, okay, I've got something that's really confusing. I don't get it. What does the form say? I don't know. Where do you go for reference? Well, this book is Fiduciary Accounting Handbook, and it's put out by Continuing Education of the Bar in Oakland, and it is a reference book. It's uh, one inch thick or more. Uh, don't buy it thinking you're going to learn how to do accounting with it. Uh, you never will because it's way too much. It's like an encyclopedia on court accounting. Now, the purpose of this book is reference. So we'll go here if we have an unusual thing. What do we do with a stock split? We don't know. Okay, so we look it up. What is it? Change in form of asset. So I point this out. It's from CEB and it costs a little bit. It's like $350 for the book. But um, it's an administrative expense. So let me see. We've gone through rental. We've gone. Now we're in the end of account period. Um, so total out all your assets in the cash accounts, the bank accounts. List the ending carry value for all of your um non-cash assets and bring forward your totals back to where we started here in the GC 400 sum on page 21. So what we've gone through is total out all your schedules, list them here, get your total beginning assets, money coming in, money going out, ending assets, and make sure you balance. Uh, and I, I point out that we had included this uh, Excel spreadsheet that showed how it looks from an Excel standpoint. And uh, I do reference that to you uh, again. And uh, it, it's useful if you're really an Excel person and it, you find it helpful. Um, one minor point I'll mention before I give the microphone back to Tamara is if you want a certificate of completion, uh, just call our office and we'll get you this con conservatorship accounting class um, certification of completion. So it's optional, just email our office. And at this point, I want to give control of the meeting back to Tamara because she has many things she wants to go over. Hello, all. I'm back. Told you I was coming back. I warned you. <laughs> okay. You kept your promise. <laughs> I did. I warned you. Okay. Now that uh, you're completely overwhelmed and um, need a margarita too, um, and you've completed your accounting and everything balances, the very last step is going to be um, how do you turn in this accounting or 
what do you turn in with it or how do you notify the court that you've done the accounting or what do you say because you can't just go through an accounting into the court and go file this okay and do what um there's the one last step is the petition for its approval so that's the last step that I'm going to be going um, through and um, I'm going to try and go somewhat quickly, but if I do and it's too fast, please tell me to slow it down. Um, I will tell you uh, that the petition needs to be on pleading paper. What does pleading paper mean? It means the number along the sides. If um, you, most people, if you're using like a PC, it will appear in Word format. But if you're using a Mac, I'm sure there's a Mac version out there. You can Google um, pleading paper, um, blank pleading paper paper and in Google and um, templates, you can get templates where you can download. And um, so you can create this all yourself, but you just can't throw this header on a blank piece of paper and turn it in. Uh, so anytime you turn in something for the court, it either needs to be on a court form or it needs to be on this pleading paper. <clears throat> As a heads up, um the the law library also has the pleading paper that you can copy and download. Correct. They, yes, they do. Especially if you're in Contra Costa, I love Miss Carrie at the library. She is so helpful. Um, if she's not there, all her assistants are so lovely and helpful. Um, you can ask them also. Okay, so we're going to start it off. How does it start? Pleading paper is going to start exactly like the inventory and appraisal did, where you put your name up here and your address, telephone number. Again, fax is optional and email address is optional. Then instead of attorney four, you would just put your name, comma, conservator. So you don't need the words attorney for. This is only if it's being filled out by an attorney. You will need to type the Superior Court of California and the county of, remember I was showing you in the inventory and appraisal, the sample was for Orange County. So you're going to put right here whatever county um, you are in or your case is in. These are a little bit more difficult to do. Um, typically, I save one template and then just reuse it sometimes. Um, but otherwise, you just type, oh, we're going to use this example, conservatorship of the, get here and make a bunch of spaces and do the shift zero. It'll make this line. Then you go down to your next line, person of, do the same thing just make spaces to get all this if you want it pretty otherwise i've seen other people who just take straight lines anyway um um sorry this would state conservatorship it could state, um, it wouldn't state just conservatorship of the person, because if you're only conservator of the person, you're not required to do an accounting. Only time you're required to do an accounting is if you're conservatorship of the estate. For a decedent's estate, of course, you always know unless it's waived, accounting is always done. A minor, also, you can be a guardian of a person um, that wouldn't require accounting. So it would be guardianship of the estate, or like I said, you could enter both. This is the name of the conservatee. You always want to indicate if they're also known as somebody else so that whoever's reading this document will understand who you're talking about. So say, for instance, you're using the legal name up here, but you don't put at otherwise known as somebody else might get it and not have a clue who you're talking about if they've never known that legal name um, of the person. 
Okay, over here you have the case number, your case number. Typically, I will separate out or put a space so that the first part of my header is on its own. Case number looks a little bit more identifiable, but you can do it either way. Then I indicate this is the first account current and report of the conservator. So for a conservatorship, typically, but not always, it's up to the court. The first year you will have to turn in an accounting, and then it's every two years after that. For a probate, it would run like from the time of your letters to the time you're asking for um, a distribution, the final distribution, or um, you would do an accounting for a partial also. Um, so that will run a longer time frame. Um, a guardianship, same thing. I believe it's the first year, and then after that, it's every two years. But you will be told by the court when your next one is due. So in this case, it's the first account. Um, some, if you've already done an accounting, you would say second account. Could be third account, fourth, fifth, whichever account you're um, at. So it's the report of the conservator and petition for the settlement. For the approval in our instance, let's just say in this petition, um, we sold because you'll see from Rex's accounting, there was a sale of reprop or sale of property. This is the only time that you can be paid as a conservator, and we will get into that. Um, you can only be paid on your accounting unless you have court approval prior. And I will tell you, it's the only time the attorney can be paid is on this petition. And you cannot typically, maybe I've not seen it, but I've not seen where they allow attorney compensation prior to that. Unless the attorney compensation, the attorney isn't the one filing the case. So you're pro per and need to pay um, legal counsel. Just say, say, for instance, you hired a law firm to complete the accounting because it was too difficult or whatever. First of all, I would tell you, maybe I shouldn't because there's probably law firm people on here, but I'd say go to an LDA first, but um uh, law firms um, can help you with accounting also. Um, so if you if you hired somebody like them, yes, you can pay them prior to getting approval. It's only if the attorney is representing you in this case that you must get approval first. But attorneys know that. They're very well aware. Okay, you will put date of hearing. Most of the time you won't know the date of hearing when you're completing this, so you would leave it blank. Because, and why do I say that? How do you not know when your hearing is? Sometimes the courts will schedule your next hearing and say they want an accounting turned in. This is the next hearing date. Sometimes they will just say um, you have an accounting due and it must be completed by this specific date. Um, that way you would not have a hearing date. So sometimes you would not know your hearing date. In fact, when you turn in this petition with your accounting, more than likely the um, filing clerk, or if you're going to take it in, the filing clerk is going to give you a hearing date. Most counties now for um, LDAs or paralegals or legal secretaries um, have to use e-file. And in that case, um, you would e-file it and then get your hearing date. Anyway, you're going to put time, the department, if you know it. I do, I, judicial officer, I, I do not put this line on mine typically because I write it within or on the order um, has the judge's name. But a lot of times what will happen is if you include this line and this judge 
if that's not the judge hearing the case that day, or if there's a pro tem or somebody like that, they have to cross it out and they have to mark up your entire document um, because this cannot say, say for instance, Michael's name and I'm sitting in, well, I can't because I'm not an attorney, but say I was sitting in on the case, I cannot use this document that has another um judge's name as the judicial officer without crossing it out so i t i just don't put it on here at all so it's up to you okay so how is it starting or how would i start what would i say i am the petitioner this is my name from now on i just am going to call myself the conservator So that means from now on, I don't have to keep saying David Lowry, conservator. I'm just going to use the words conservator. That's all that means. So as conservator of the estate of the conservatee, I present to you for settlement and allowance. I verified first account and report. So basically you can almost repeat this. And I, as the petitioner, respectfully state these facts. Okay, some of this you say, well, it really seems like it's redundant because the judge can look up when I was appointed or the judge can look up when I turned in an inventory appraisal. I always tell, especially like people who will do interns with me or um, I'm trying to teach our assistant now um, more of this type of work. And I always have to remind her that your document has to stand on its own. And what that means is if anybody picks up that document and goes to read it, say, they need to know exactly what it's about not go look in the file not go look at the computer not go look uh, ask your assistant not look at anything it should be self-explanatory in your document so we started off saying appointment so me the petitioner was appointed the conservator of the person in the estate of her also known as her and this date. So if you will remember, this is the exact date you saw in my inventory and appraisal that the order that I was ordered um, conservator on March 8th. And I received my letters on March 14th. Again, this is could be an example of the judge said, please go get a bond. Um, it took me a few days or it could have been this was a Thursday and the bond company was closed Friday or, you know, whatever the case may be. So anyway, this is when the order was signed. This is when I received the letters. And at all times since then, I have been acting as the conservator. Number two inventory and appraisal. So you saw we completed that before we got to even this point. An inventory and appraisal of the state was um, returned to me and filed um, and the date it was filed showing the value of the state being this. Now, of course, my example, again, I didn't show you where the um, probate referee gave a value, but this number will be what's on the total line of the inventory and appraisal. And if anybody needs me to go, go back to the inventory and appraisal and show them where I can, if not, I'll just keep going. Okay. So number three, the periods of the account. I'm telling the judge who's reading this, what is my account period? Yes, I can tell him, well, just go look. No, I, I'm trying to just let him read my paper and go, oh, wow, everything's great. I know everything and 
let me glance. Yes, that matches. Good. We're ready to go. Sign off and you're on your way. If the judge has to start searching, trying to find answers, questions, likely it will be rejected because they really just don't have time to do that. So anyway, my period of account, this account covers the period of March 8th, day of my appointment, see how that matches, and it goes to March 7th. So we have one year. Now, in the next case, it may go from March, and then you'll have two years. Now, here's the other trick that I tend to do with my accountings and um, have never had an issue, never had a problem, and never had them rejected for this reason. I myself will not end an accounting period, even though it's one year, I will not end it on this day. I myself will end it on the last day of the month or when the bank statement um, it's the last part of the bank statement. So again, let me go to further. I have a bank statement that goes from March 1st to March 31st. I will end this account period on March 31st so that it covers the entire period that's on the bank statement. Then my next accounting that I turn in would start April 1st of that next year and go to March 31st of the two years later. So I really will bounce off after the first one is approved. I usually end this on a statement date. And so some or you may ask why. It's so much easier for me to see the balance matches and anybody else to see the balance matches when my bank statement balance at the end of it matches the same thing the accounting does. Um, I'm not trying to figure out how to explain that the balance on the seventh is a totally different number or not shown on the bank statement or something like that. And I don't like that when I'm ending, I have, um, uh, my last bank statement has two transactions that go on this account period and 10 others that go on my next one. I just like to incorporate them and end it when the um, bank statement ends. So the other example would be that my bank statement um, goes the 15th through the 15th or the 14th through the 15th. And so my bank statement may end on March 15th or March 20th or something like that. I would continue it until the um, end of the bank statement. And I can tell you it's never been asked of me, told to me or, or whatever, but I've seen it done by many other people besides me this way, and I believe that they understand and know why I ended it that way, just because it's cleaner. And then you pick up the next one on a brand new bank statement. Okay, so any questions about that? Because I that kind of can get a tiny bit confusing. Or is everyone good? Okay. I'll keep going. So charges and credits, as you'll remember from the accounting that Rex did, very odd, but they call it charges and credits. So you're saying the conservator should be allowed what's on the summary of the account, and you can really just copy this exact wording. Authorized investments. Here's the other thing when doing this petition, and I'll teach you right now, is if you don't have authorized investments, don't include the wording authorized investments and then write, oh, I don't have any. Um, just leave it off. So in some of these, and I'm only saying a very few. So let me, I learned my lesson. So I've taught this class many years, and before I said, well, if you don't need the, and again, I'm using this example, if you don't need it, just leave it out, right? <laughs> I got an accounting back that I had to review and approve because it kept getting rejected. And I looked at it and like, 
she completed one, two, and three, and then jumped to uh, number 15 and left out some really important um, sections. So you cannot leave out of them all. S most of them really mean something and need to be there. But when you're talking about authorized investments, if your conservative does not have any investments, you're not going to put this in here because you don't have any and it looks silly. So just keep that in mind. Um, some of these you may not have. Most of these you will need to complete. But this one, if there's no authorized investments, don't put it in. We're going to assume there was. So during the account period, all of the cash has been invested in interest-bearing accounts or investments. Remember, here's the other thing. If you are a conservator and you get um, an account that the conservatee already has, and you're going to keep that account, you need to make sure when you're adding your name to the account as the conservator, you also tell them it must be in an interest-bearing account. And the important thing for people who are doing conservatorships and their new at it or guardianships, if you do not put the money in an interest-bearing account or you just assume that the account they had was an interest bearing account and it does not get interest like so two years later one of the beneficiaries go wait a minute where's all the interest this money should have been earning and you say uh they're not interest bearing accounts well that's on you and what could happen and what I have seen happen just a couple of times, but I've seen it happen, is that beneficiary sues the conservator for the interest the money would have gained if it was in an interest-bearing account. And that conservator was solely responsible for paying that interest that they forgot to make sure the account was an interest-bearing account. So, again, protect yourself. Make sure it's an interest-bearing account. It doesn't matter if it's gaining one penny per month. It's gaining something. And you're proving that you're maximizing the conservatee's assets. Okay. Statement of liabilities, um, if there are any, but you're basically going to say, say, that there's no liens, there's no taxes due, there's no judgments um, on the estate. This would not be a one that is optional. It should be included every time. Number seven, this one would be optional if you did not sell an automobile or did not sell any belongings of the conservator. You do not need to add it in here. So again, number seven would be optional. But in this case, um, the conservator sold the automobile because they knew either the conservatee lost their license, no longer drive whatever the purpose. Um, if they have an automobile, they lose their license or they're not able to drive or they have dementia or anything like that. That means they don't have capacity so they could get lost. Um, they're fragile. They have any other condition, even though they still have their driver's license, but they shouldn't drive. Then that's up to you to notify DMV if you want and say they shouldn't have their license or, um, but there's no reason for you to keep the automobile, keep paying auto insurance, keep paying, uh, probably not payments on the automobile, but keep uh, um, gas or oil changes or charging the battery because the battery goes dead after a while if it's not driven. There's no reason to have those expenses if the conservatee is never going to be able to drive the vehicle. That does not mean that you keep, also does not mean that you keep the vehicle insured and all of that so that you can drive the vehicle even to take them to places. 
I have a question. Uh huh. Does the probate courts for me, the probate code specify the items that must be included in the accounting? Does the probate the code code um, likely... because you're talking about? Go ahead. You're talking about which ones are optional and which ones are not. So I'm just curious, um, is this specified in the code or the rules, what items it must could, be included? I don't know. I've never looked at the code, um, but I, I'm using just from my years of experience and knowing that I'm talking about the accounting and what happened this year. So if I did not sell a vehicle, I wouldn't put that in here. But if instead, let's say I sold an art collection or I did um, something else, the let's say they had a horse and the horse died, I would include something like that. But it's pretty, it's got to be major things. It's not like, okay, I, I don't know, um, had a garage sale and um, sold, let's say their reading books because they had a book collection or something like that. And maybe I would, because then I could just put it up. I'm being honest and telling not only the court, but I'm telling all the beneficiaries that they no longer have this item that they used to have in possession. But I've not really read, uh, to be honest, the probate code on the court accounting to see um, if it states specific items or what needs to be in there or does it. Okay, thank you. But I'll look for you just out of curiosity for the next uh, time I talk in so I can look it up and have the answer. So again, in this um, so in this example, there was a sale of an automobile. So they're saying I sold the automobile. If you look at the inventory and appraisal, again, why attachment two? Attachment two is non-cash. It was item number seven on that inventory and appraisal I did. I sold it for a loss. You can find it on Schedule D of the accounting. And I request that the court approve that I sold it for a loss. So say for instance, why why would I sell it for a loss? So say the inventory, the probate referee, I gave them the make, model, and mileage on the vehicle. So they appraised it, let's just say 5,000. But I didn't tell them the whole passenger side. Um, somebody has wrecked it and you can't even open the passenger door. Or I didn't indicate um, there's huge front end damage or even a little bit of damage. And I just couldn't sell the car for what they're saying it's worth. I would explain that all here, um, and that would be a reason for a loss, or I quickly wanted to get rid of it, or um, but you can't sell it for too much of a loss. Be careful about selling anything at a loss, because one, you have to explain it, and if th they have reason to believe you sold it for a loss because you sold it to a family member, oh boy. You're going to get talked to um, on that. Or you sold it for a loss because you just didn't want to hassle with it. You might get a little bit of talking to you for that also. Um, so careful on the whole loss thing. Um, and just be, just explain. Okay, so we're down to sale of furniture. Again, they sold, they're saying they sold um, the home. So there's no reason to keep all the furniture. She is in, let's say a care facility, or maybe she came into my house and I don't need any of the furniture she had because I have all the furniture, um, bedroom sets and all that maybe. When she came to the house, she needed a different type of bed, you know, an electric bed as opposed to, so her bed at home wasn't of any use to me. Um, so you indicate why 
um, you sold or what you sold. And um, another good thing is if you read through here, so you sold it at the same price as any consignment shop or a um, yard sale or Goodwill or, you know, say stuff, use words like that, or they weren't valuable enough for an auction. Um, and, and, or a lot of times, if you do something like an estate sale, you can say, I sold all these items for this amount, but I also had to pay whoever helped me. And even if it's a child, daughter, whatever, you had to pay them for their time. Or I had to, a lot of times people will hire like, a, I think they're professional estate sellers um, to do all the sales for you. So they make the flyers, um, put all, organize all the stuff and just make it look pretty. And they're the ones that are out there the whole time while you're taking care of the conservator and then you would have to pay a fee. So this is explaining that there was a fee paid for the um, garage sale or whatever it was. Okay. So the next one, sale of real property. Again, this could be um, optional. If you didn't have a sale of a real property, you don't need to indicate it. But in this case, I sold the vacation home in Palm Springs. It was a gain. You'll see it on the accounting. And I want the court to confirm or bless my sale. Additional bond. Here's the other thing we got into on the inventory and appraisals. So now you're going to see what has happened. So when you did the inventory and appraisal, the home was a non-cash asset. The bond only has to cover cash. Okay. So that's why I asked, is the 57000 remember, it's all cash, um, is the 57000 thousand is your bond enough i didn't consider what was in um attachment two because i didn't need to the only thing a bond covers is cash a bond doesn't cover assets that are non-cash that would be appraised by um, a probate referee so again we're going to go back to the cash so at the time i had fifty seven thousand dollars say i had a sixty thousand dollar bond well, now, as you will see up top, you saw, see, I sold a car, I've sold a vacation home. So what do you think has happened to my cash? It's increased because now what used to be a non-cash asset, the vacation home in Palm Springs has turned into a cash asset. So now, instead of the $57,000 in cash, I um, have, I'm just going to use any number, $184,000 in cash. Now, my bond for $60,000, is it enough when I have $184,000 in cash? No. So what I'm going to say, I'm going to be up front, hey, at the time of the sale, I had a bond, it was $60,000, but now I sold the vacation home. Now I have $184,000. Um, you can go on your own and get the bond increase, or you can wait for the court to tell you to increase the bond. But down here, I would say, so my bond's not sufficient. If the court wishes to increase the bond, they can, blah, 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 or... I, you know, just put your own, this is kind of your own free wordings in here, but just tell the court and be honest. Hey, I just know my bond doesn't cover. I'm going to leave it up to you, whether you wish to increase the bond amount or not. On a first accounting, more than likely, if you're on your fifth, ninth, whatever, 
and they've already seen a pattern of you caring for the conservatives' money, and you've been very good, very diligent, very um, mindful, and very frugal, and everything else, they may not care to increase because they know that the risk is so much lower of that money disappearing. Okay, so the next one is number 11. This absolutely 100% must, and I use that with capital letters, be in your petition. So it says no affiliate relationship. Okay, so I'm going to go through that. During the account period, me as the conservator has not hired an agent who is a family or affiliate relationship to me. I may use this other quick example. Okay, so you have a conservative estate and they have a home, um, their real home, and you still own it. So the gardener comes, let's say, once a week and the gardener charges $80 every time he comes. Reasonable, right? Now, the gardener tells you he's going on a two-month vacation, let's say, to Europe. And you go, oh, Jesus, I got to find another gardener, right? So, okay, I got to find another gardener to take up that two months because we really like our gardener. So um, you're going through, you can't seem to find a gardener or you forgot to get a gardener and it's coming up on the week. You probably could go a week without eh, um, having it done. It depends, like, say, if it's in a homeowner's association where they're really sticky about um, maybe the gardening. But say you went a week, I'm sure that'd be okay. But, um, but so you forgot to hire a gardener and you're like, oh, no, I'm in trouble. Well, then all of a sudden your son comes in and he's home from college He's running around and mom, I want $25 for a haircut or $35 for a haircut. And you go, no, go. Hey, 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 whoa, wait a second. By the way, <laughs> I got a job for you. I need you to go over and mow these lawns and I'll pay you just for going because I know you need money and I know you need uh, college books. I'll pay you $100 to go there and um, and I need it done for the next two months since you're on vacation. Can you see any problem with that? Y'all are crickets. Okay, here's the problem. Yes, there is a huge problem. One, not that it's my son because it's unfortunate for him he's my son because he's got to deal with me. But no, just kidding. Um, but not only is he my son, but I was paying the regular gardener $80 and um, every time they came out. Just because it's my son and I know he needs money for college and books doesn't mean I can tell him, okay, for a hundred bucks, I'll pay you. One, that's misuse of the conservatives funds. Not that I hire my son, so it's perfectly okay if I would have told my son, hey, I need you to go mow the lawns and I'm paying you $80 just like I'm paying the other gardener. I'm going to pay you $80 just like I would pay them and pay it to my son. Perfectly fine. It'd go through. Okay, you paid your son the same thing the regular gardeners. Now, they may say if it was like different than gardening, well, is your son a professional? Does he have a business? Is he like, I couldn't have told my son who's in college, hey, build a back fence because no, <laughs> when the judge would go, does he know how to build? You know, like there's a whole lot of other things. But when we're talking only gardening, um, 
you know, any child, I did it as a child, um, can do the gardening. So if you hire someone again, like I said, say you're doing an estate sale, you're getting rid of garage sale or whatever, you have your daughter, your niece, your nephew, somebody um, come over, help you sit and uh, manage the garage sale. So you paid them a little bit. Just be mindful. Don't be over extravagant in what you're paying them. And so I had this one where they did a garage sale and they made a, let's say they made $500 and then they said or tried to say in a petition to the court that, um, that their daughter was there for 12 hours and um, what she said she would pay as an hourly rate equaled the $500 they made in the garage sale. Now, does that make sense? No, like you can't pay your daughter the same thing that you made. And so basically it's like you could have just gave it to goodwill and it would have accomplished the same thing. You just can't do stuff like that. So you must disclose if you hire anybody who is a family friend or a boyfriend or somebody that you personally know. Most of the time you will state you didn't hire any, um, buddy that's your family friend i typically tried to stay away from that when you have a conservatorship just just even though your best friend works on cars and tells you he's going to give you this grand deal say he does and he screws it up and now the car no longer runs who's going to be blamed for that mechanic and it not i know yes you it could have been any mechanic and that's totally different. But, oh, you had a family friend who promised you he was this miracle worker. And now he screwed up the Mercedes. And we want you to pay for that screw up of the Mercedes. Or I could just see all the other things that could happen in that. So careful on how you're doing your hiring of professionals. Okay. Conservators compensation. Again, this was a place where I told you you are not compensated unless you ask the court for prior approval or you ask for what they call like a stipend, which means a monthly um, like reserved amount because um, for a payment to get the court to approve that better have pretty good reason. Otherwise, likely it will be no. And um, so at this point, you're allowed to ask for compensation. Um, you need to state in here approximately how many hours. This would not really include, like, say, for instance, the conservatee lives with me 24 hours, seven days a week. You're not going to be paid for every hour you helped this person. Guaranteed. Because when they're sleeping, you're sleeping so it's really not 24-7. Um, but anyway, in this case, the person was in a care home. So the conservatee just went over there and maybe take her, took her to haircuts and um, maybe get her toenails or her nails, doctor's appointments, um, uh, stuff like that. Um, then those hours accounted. So in this case, the conservator spent 150 hours. It's his mother. Um, he visited, and he says what he did, visited the daycare, I mean, daycare, the care facilities where she lived once a week, made sure she was receiving proper care, all her needs were met, marshaled all the assets, paid all the bills on time, was frugal, arranged for the sale of the automobile because she can no longer drive, listed. I mean, you get the point. So you're listing everything you're doing. In this case, the conservator requests that he get $500 for these 150 hours. So if you're going into a conservatorship because you lost your job and this is the only thing that you can think of doing, I'll tell you right now, you aren't going to live off of conservatorship fees. Just not going to happen. Most of the time, one, the conservatee does not have all that much, but two, the court themselves is not going to allow to 
the conservative to spend every bit of their money that they have in paying you. Now, that doesn't mean if you're going to get a gig or something through IHSS that that isn't a side thing. Remember what you're talking about here has to do with the conservatives money. So you're asking the judge to take from the conservative money and to pay you. I can tell you that there are uh, local court rules that allow for the fee amount, um, the fee for a non-professional fiduciary is $75 an hour. In this case, because this is his mother, he can really, look, you can tell it's like pennies on the hours, um, but you can charge $75 up to $75. It doesn't have to be at that amount that you ask for um, reimbursement. In this case, he's saying he wants to be compensated because he missed work. So that meant he didn't get paid for work or maybe he did if he took sick leave, but he didn't get paid from work to attend court hearings or he didn't get paid, say he was a contractor or something like that. And he didn't get paid from work um, or lost money because he was taking her to doctor appointments and stuff. So we asked for compensation. Okay, this is optional. Again, if you do not have an attorney and you are not going to be paying an attorney, you don't really need to include anything about an attorney compensation. So in this example, though, the attorney was retained by the conservator. The law office, he needs, he being the attorney will know they need a declaration. They need a declaration which explains their invoice, which they will also include. So they will need to state what they did, how much time they spent, what their hourly rate was, um, everything like that. And so that will be part of an explanation. In this case, this attorney is requesting 3000 500 saying it is reasonable compensation um, for the work he did and that needs to be approved by the judge whether the judge feels that's reasonable or not will be dependent upon the details he puts on his invoice so you would just include this if you have an attorney that you need to pay or leave it out if there's no attorney we're almost done, by the way. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit faster and not um, say my examples. So veteran benefits, um, this is not an option. You will include in here whether the conservatee is getting any um, benefits from the veterans. You, this is not an optional one either, the state hospital. So is the conservatee a patient in the state hospital? Most of the times, if they are, the state hospital will request um, like funds or to be paid or uh, stuff like that. And the courts just want to know about that. Conservatives address. Um, if they're in a care facility, I will typically put that. If they, they are not, and again, they're at home. I do not like to state where they are or make it easy for somebody else to know that at a, a certain address is a very elderly person who has dementia. So I would not put it. Um, I may put the conservatee's address. The conservatee is still live, living in her primary residence in the city of Tus in California or something like that. I'm still telling the court where she, she's at, but I'm not giving an exact address for somebody else to go knock on their door or bug them. Okay, number 17 is not optional, account statements. So please note that when you're um, submitting your accounting to the court, you must also attach the bank statements. Um, the bank statements must be originals. 
if they are not originals because you have thrown them away or lost them or something has happened, you must go to the bank and ask the bank to print the bank statements and that bank must stamp them or certify them that they are true and correct. You are not allowed to go on to, say for instance, Wells Fargo and print bank statements. The reason for that is they can be altered. Um, anybody knows or anybody who is good enough with a computer, I can tell you if you gave me a PDF of a bank statement, I could alter it any way, any which way, and you would never even know or see that I altered that PDF. Um, <clears throat> the, so the banks do not rely on copies you must submit originals um, and they are not attached to this petition. You actually submit them. And I know Rex has a sample in his examples where you have a cover sheet that is marked confidential that you um, submit or your bank statements. The other thing I do with bank statements myself is I will redact all but the last four digits the court is not looking that an account matches or anything like that. What are they looking at? They're looking at a bank statement that has your name as conservator, the conservatee's name right below, um, and they're looking at the balances in the account or any transactions that occurred. They may do a spot check or something like that to make sure you've noted them on the bank statement so on and so forth, but you must turn in bank statements. So make sure that the other thing I do is a lot of banks, they automatically do a let's go paperless. In your case, you tell them your statements must be submitted to the court. So you cannot go paperless. You want the paper copy mailed. Now, some people have told me, well, I like the option of online and being able to print them because I could see them and blah, blah, blah. If you like that option, just know when it's time to do your accounting, you're going to have to go to the bank and have them print original copy statements some banks charge. I've seen a bank... Um, what did they charge like five dollars a month um and it ended up being a huge charge if you have more than one bank um or more than one account i need it for every account and they weren't consolidated so i mean this one conservator spent like four hundred dollars in getting bank statements and charged the conservatee and yeah he had to pay back that charge um, because no, that's not allowed. So just keep that in mind when setting up the accounts or using their account and redoing it. Um, so all that information will be here. Capital changes, this has to be there. It's coming from the um, accounting. Um, it reads capital changes. So in this case, there are no changes in form on non-cash assets. What that means is um, a change of form would be, and likely there are a lot of changes of, uh, in form. Like, so say for instance, you have a checking a savings, uh, we'll just use checking and savings. And your checking got down low, so your savings transferred um, $10,000 to your checking. That's a change in form. So you may not have that. You may. Let's go down. Statement of liabilities. Uh, again, um, only if there's a mortgage, if you have um, an outstanding loan, you would state what the interest rate is, blah, blah, blah. Request for special notice. What is that? That must be in every single um, petition. Request for special notice is anybody, and I'm talking anybody in this world, can pay $20, I think it is, we just did a couple, it can pay $20 and fill out a request for special notice form, turn it into the court, and every single time that you file a document with the court, I get a copy of it. 
All I all I I don't have to be related. I don't have to know anything about the case. I don't have to be the attorney. I don't have to be in a party. I don't have to be anybody. If I give $20 and fill out a request for special notice and on your account, because I just want to know it's just for fun. And I want to spend the $20 every single time you file an accounting or an inventory and appraisal or anything like that, I can get the um, copy of it. And actually, you must send me a copy of it um, so I become part of your service list just for that. So in this case, most of the time, the request for special notices, um, let's say I'm going to use a probate case and I'm going to talk about a decedent's estate. There are a lot of times that a beneficiary, because a probate no lie takes about two years from beginning to end. I have not seen them any faster, although I try my hardest because I don't get paid till the probate case closes. But um, it's uh, honestly about two years. Sometimes the beneficiaries cannot wait. They won't be patient. So they take what's called an inheritance advance. Um, I dislike those highly, especially because of the fact that if you borrow $10,000, you pay back twenty. dollars so it's almost half, nine times out of 10. Um, they get most of the people by saying, hey, if you give us back our money within 90 days, you only have to pay a quarter of what you borrowed. If it's um, three months, you have to pay half. If it's six months, you have to pay um, three quarters. And people think, oh yeah, I'm going to get my inheritance real soon, real soon. Two years, that's the soonest that... Any, uh, maybe a year and a half, but no less. Um, and so they trick people into thinking that in nine times out of 10, they owe double the amount they borrowed. They will always file a request for special notice because they want to know what's going on. They want to make sure their money's secure. Say, for instance, I say, um, Tom Smith is no longer a beneficiary. Well, that's huge to them because they just lent him ten thousand dollars um so on and so forth so anyway this you must state on there if somebody's filed for a special notice you will get this special notice in the mail if somebody does file on the case okay i'm at the end so what am i saying so i'm saying your honor I am praying that you do the following, that this account is approved and settled, that all of my acts are approved, so everything I did is approved, that the sale of the automobile is approved, and now won't be on, um, won't be a depreciating asset, that the sale of the furniture is confirmed, and you approve it. And what is the purpose or what is the reason that you're asking for the court to approve it? What happens is, say, for instance, you sold the car and um, it was worth 10000 You sold it for eight, so it lost $2,000. Um, and a year or two later, a beneficiary comes back and says, hold on, wait a minute. She lost $2,000 on that car. I want her to pay the amount of the loss since um, it should been sold for 10 blah 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 court approved it sorry run out of luck court approves it you're off the hook you're it, you, it's considered you you're okay and let them try and come back and tell the court otherwise when the court the court will likely say and i'm talking nine and a half times out of ten the court will say i approved it it's settled it's done it's not arguable at this point. So it lets you off the hook. They can't come back later and say, oh, no, you, whatever. Anyway, okay, um, at this point, you're saying uh, I should be directed to pay myself $500 compensation. I also am requesting the attorney to pay the attorney the $3,500. And 
you always, always, always want to include this last statement that judge whatever relief or whatever else that you want to rule on, write it here. I, I'm good with it. You date it, you sign your, you put your name under here and sign it as the conservator. Again, my example includes if there's an attorney, don't do it this way, but always the attorney would be first and then um, the conservator would sign the verification. So if this is a little funky, but um, you would not have this because there is no attorney. And then there is this always thing. So for a long time, I would always get these accounting rejected and somebody would call me up say they need help they got a tentative ruling it said um um that that i needed to submit a verified deck uh, what the heck is a verified deck i don't understand it i don't know i don't know what it means here is what it means and i always laugh because i instantly know what it means so you have complete on the slide up you have completed a declaration you are verifying, saying you declare under penalty of perjury, it is true and correct. And th the only thing, even though you say a whole lot up here, what they are looking for is this one last line. So you're saying under penalty of perjury, under the laws of the state of California, that what you are saying in this declaration regarding your accounting is true and correct and you date it and you sign it. So always, always, always include this verification. Otherwise your entire accounting and petition will be knocked out and rejected. I have a question. Yes, son. Um, do you have to pay for this, for the petition to accept the accounting? Uh, no? Yes, ma'am, unless fee? you're on a, P a fee waiver. Okay. So it's a, the $435? Yes, ma'am, unless you're on a fee waiver. Okay, thank you. But the conservative pays for it, really, if you have control of the account, not you. That's their expense. So I'm now to the end. Oh, here is the bank statement. So again, forget all this header up here. It should be just your name, address. It wouldn't have attorney for. You would just put your name as the conservator. Here is the county. Um, here's the case. These are your original bank statements for your first account. You just put on here original bank statements. The clerk, the filing clerks know automatically that the bank statements are not part of the file. And what that does that mean? It means that they can't be searched online like other documents. When they your file goes to records, it they cannot be copied in records. Nothing um, else can be done. So I am done. We're done. I know I'm 23 minutes late. Are there any questions or anything that I went too fast I should cover? I think may maybe some people have dropped off because they had to go. But um, we will, again, let me state this again. If I went too fast or if you attempt to do any of this and you get lost or confused or you just say, oh my God, I need to see that one more time. Please sign up for the next class. It's free. You can watch this. You can be on with me every single week. Yes, I do kind of repeat 90% of what I'm saying, but there's a lot of times I give other examples. I allow you to ask questions. Um, so you're free to ask any questions, anything like that. So make sure you take advantage. There's a possibility you'll turn in your first accounting and then you go two years before you turn in the next one. You go, Jesus, I don't even remember how to do that anymore, right? Come back to the class and, you know, as long as we're still giving it, come back to the class, take it again. Um, maybe there's other people, maybe we add other things. Dependent upon what I see when I'm doing a lot of corrections on accountings and um, dependent upon 
what I see or what I have or whatever. Um, I'll add materials or give you examples or tell you what not to do or what's important. And um, I, I really like the feedback from the class because a lot of times like um, they'll go, yeah, I took the class. I tried to do the accounting, but I just didn't do it properly for one way or another. Then I look at that accounting in a whole different light because then I'll look at it and go, okay, what did I fail at teaching? That's the first thing I'm looking for. What did I fail at teaching? Because I really want to make it to where if I teach this to you, you should be able to do it. Unless it's a highly complicated, like I've gotten some back where it was so complicated. It was hard for me to sit down and do um, and took many hours. And I thought, well, there's no way you could have tackled this even if you really wanted to and you had the best intentions because here I am been doing it for years. I can't barely tackle it. So don't feel overwhelmed. Don't feel um, that you can't do it. If it really is too hard, hard go high, find somebody, um, an LDA, a law firm, somebody that, but I will tell you, do not most of the time don't just hire a cpa cpas do not know how to do a court accounting you really want to make sure the person that you're looking for um knows how to do court um conservatorship accounting and have some years in doing it um where they can help you because a CPA can say, yeah, I can do any accounting you want. I'm a CPA. But if they don't know how to do the court accounting, it will not be approved. So that's it. Um, I just wanted to tell you that um, on, the, on the handout, it yeah. does say it goes to 1230. So you don't have to worry. Oh, good. <laughs> we changed that. You know, it used to, when we were doing it in person before COVID, it would stop at 12, you know, because they needed to use the conference room and blah, blah. And we would always run over and I'm like, how do I talk faster? Um, And blah, blah, blah. So now I just automatically say, oh my God, I'm going to go over. <laughs> okay. But I don't want to miss anything. Yeah. One less thing to worry about. <laughs> right. Right. So thank you guys. Thank you for hanging in there. If you have any suggestions or comments or anything like that, I know Rex probably explained or gave you the, um, you can rate the class or you can provide it. If you didn't like the class at all, it, don't tell us you did just to tell us you did. It, you know, we use that to go, okay, how do we make ourselves better? We, neither him or I will, you know, hate you or say, oh my God, you know, you're mean or anything like that. We take everything positively. It really helps us to teach others um, and helps us to know what material you like most, you didn't like, or what could have been ignored or anything like that. So please feel free to um, fill that out if you would like to make a comment or two or otherwise um, you're free to go. I'm going to drop this again. Reminder, if you want the certificate stating that you did complete the course, um, I believe Rex um, uh, provided the email address on um, where you can send your request. I myself create those certificates. I am only here at this office to be able to create them on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Otherwise, I have my own business. I do um, Monday, Thursday, Friday. So um, if you send it in on one of those days, I'm not here. It's going to have to wait till I come in, but I will issue or send you a certificate. It's a cute little green certificate stating you've completed the course. Um, you can hand it in to the judge to say, hey, I completed the course or not. Um, I don't think you get brownie points for it, but um, it, it just is something nice to have that you completed. And so you know about the accounting and you realize the importance of it. So just know, again, if you send me a request and it's on a day that I am not here, I won't likely complete it till Tuesday or Wednesday when I do come in. 
Thank you so very much. It was so informative. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, all take care. Okay. Enjoy the uh, one more day of the week and the upcoming weekend. And if you want to attend again, I think the next one is December. Yes, December 8th, a little bit early because of the holidays at the end. If not, um, we will put out the um, next year's schedule soon, or you can go to the court website. All right. Thanks again. Bye -bye. All right. Take care, all. Bye bye. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. All right. Take care, Hans. Bye. Care. Bye bye. Rex. He's what? I don't know how to turn off the. Um... God, I'm so. I I think I don't. I know he. I just saves or does something with these. All I did was stop a okay. video, but it still says recording. That's weird. So it's recording the audio, maybe.